Yeah. Well, my thing was that it was expression is kind of this small. I know. <laughs> but I mean, I kept looking through it and I was like, well, I mean, really what you're concerned about is the alpha, the x, and the v. And everything else is constant. So I guess it could be long. But at the end of the day, the calculation is complex. Right. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense. The less you have the computer do for you, it's only the, the dynamic problem, the dynamic system that you've got to worry about. So, right. You know, so I just power through it. So today we'll do the same format with pretty much every week we do it. Uh, lecture. There's no microphone, but you guys can hear me in the back. I think it's really fun. It's a software that was in the We'll do the lecture. I'll give a little break in between. This is kind of the two lectures. Uh, and then we'll switch to the same and we'll do the first part of the lab. And hopefully we'll try to have more time for the lab tonight. Because last week we had a lot of introduction to the whole area. But then we'll do the math lab swimming part of the lab and then the inside. And then we have a couple of students. Uh, so uh, during the break, to the talk of saying who's new that wasn't here last week for four people. So Sang's in the back, and you can raise your hand. So he has the room, has the group. And then also, and then Sang will say, you know, to figure out two stuff later. Okay, and then the homework's due tomorrow, right? And you can ask us, you know, if you have any questions on the homework. Uh, let us know. That. That, the actual the homework one, the, the it's pretty big mathematical <laughs> equation, but that's not the actual incentive model. So if we have all the parameters, we're going to simplify it so we can actually get that. Okay, so what we want to cover today, so last week we kind of gave a little bit of introduction and a few different things. We want to get into working on uh, looking at the state-based modeling again for state-based modeling, and then our plan is can we actually solve the systems represented in state-based, right? So we're going to spend a couple of weeks doing this. So this is part of the linear system theory. A lot of these techniques are tools that you would learn to, to solve the system. What do you mean by solving the system? Like given a certain input, you need to find the output. So today we're going to start with a few things just to kind of do a little bit more definition, some properties of systems. Because in the most general sense, we're talking about linear system theory of the system. Of course, we're saying linear. It has to be linear, so we want to say, well, what does that mean? We want to give formal definitions so we can kind of have it for that. It could be, I have this LTV, LTI will be our system, so the L linear, right? So we're talking about linear. We had to figure out if the system's linear. And then TV and TI is time variant or time invariant. Right? So in this class, all the methods we're doing could work with linear time varying systems. So if you think about the ABCD matrix permutations of time, and that's okay. And that's what or it could be time invariant, so we'll see that's more just be constant for, for that case. So we we'll want to make sure we all understand what that means. Uh, and there are a couple other properties we'll go through um, for systems that are more you know, practical systems we work on what we're going to talk about. 
And then we'll look at the concept of what is the impulse response. So that's if you put an impulse into the system, what's the output, and you'll see that that describes what we hear the system was tied to the transfer function uh, through this is going into the frequency domain, like what we talked about last time, transfer function is a frequency domain method, right? And it's related to the time domain to the impulse response of in the time domain. And then we want to see how the transfer function is state space. Those represent or how we, how we can use this and how they relate to each other. So in the lab today, we're going to be working a lot on that. So MATLAB, it's very easy. We'll, we'll see the kind of how, how they're related. When you start working with MATLAB, it's a single command. Why right? we'll say like transfer function to state space or state space to transfer function. So you can see it when that's happening, but you can see two representations. So the transfer function in space space are really just going to be two ways of looking at the model of your system. So this would be the system like for our MinSet, right? Or for our car or a lot of And then the concept of equivalent systems, we'll cover that at the end. And it's like if you have different representations of your system, you can actually do, use a lot of different math to model your system, come up with different models, and you want to see are those models talking about the same system or not. So we can do that in the So let's look at properties of the system. The first, the first property, we'll, we'll look at properties uh, first. So first one will be, uh, we'll talk about memory list. This will be the first one. So if you're when talking about a system, right? So we're gonna have uh, we're gonna think of this U of T going into your system, and then the output is going to Y of T. <laughs> and the system we can represent together today. Oh, I just put system. Later we'll use like a a, a G of T or you know, in the in this case we'll so maybe. G of T, we'll see what that means later. That's actually the So in this case, the system. So when we talked about last time was you know open loop, closed loop feedback control, and generally you know, what this whole area is. The system is what we want to control. Right? So this is our inside, this is the robot bucket, whatever description inside of this block, right? So we're gonna figure out you know, mathematically, we're describing the system in here. In this class, we want to do state space, but you can also do transfer function, right? It's if you have a single point to point on the So, what does it mean to have your system be memoryless? So, in this case, it, this means that the output, in this case, output of your system, yt, uh, uh, only depends on, uh, on the input. Out so that's really writing it out in definition. So it doesn't have any memory. So it doesn't have coding, no memory, right? So you figure out the uh, I give you an input at this instant of time t1 or something. You can find y t1. Right? You don't need the if system would be memoryless if you didn't need any need anything else. Like you didn't need any past values or you didn't need any future values to do that. So if we look at this in terms of uh, like just for some some examples, maybe you know, figure this out. So if I give it in terms of like an equation and I say like y of t is uh, just four u of t. So maybe that's our system, right? What kind of system is this? Like it's just general terms of you. If you wanted to describe this system, what is it? You could probably make it with not being in a circuit. Wouldn't be time reversal, right? That would be the negative T. Uh, well, so your Y T is output, the input is U T. And what is the system doing? What is the output? What is it doing to the input? <laughs> yeah, amp someone said amplification, right? So this is really like an amplifier. Right? So it's just multiplying the input by four. That's all in terms of this, like mathematically, I'm just saying this is amplifier. Amplifiers, right? You can't use just RLC circuits, right? So the voltage divider, you have to use hot to build something like this. 
to do that. So if you look at this, and so if I gave you a system that's just an amplifier like this, so it could be any, any constant, say that, and then say it's a system like this. All right, so what do you think? Yes, because it only needs the current state y at time t. So you put plug-in values of time, you know, y0 is just for u0. And one is u4, times u1. So that means that it doesn't need any past or future values of those. So then it can crank. So this would be memoryless. And then if you did, if you had something like this, say t minus 3 times u1 so if you're on doing, what kind of system is this? That's a time. Yeah, a delay system, right? So we can think about it in terms of your working on like, uh, just looking at the signal, right? So you can see what, what's happening here in terms of your, the output is a delayed version of the, of the input. So then you can say, well, is this memory test, right? And what would be your guess? Is the system is this delay system memory bus? Because what? It's a time reversal, right? Yeah, because you're playing you're also playing around with time, right? And so the, this property of memory list is a time property, right? So it's kind of you know it's in terms of the time happening in the system. So what all, some of these examples I give you, if it, if I start changing time around. To be like a red flag, you're gonna say, "Oh, okay, let's check." Right? So, so one thing you can do here is you can plug in values of time. If you know the y at one, time one is you need u at minus two. Well, you're not talking about the same time. You needed some u at, at minus two to get to whatever time one second. You have to look back, right? So that would not be one of those. Is everyone kind of clear for that? Time. And then you can also look like <clears throat> other examples where you're messing around with time would be something like you would put this oh just have like three t. It could be any kind of time. So the, the middle one is time shifting. It could have been a plus or minus there, right? Uh, the third example is time scaling. So you have to be careful here too, right? So is that is it memoryless? No, because why well, you can just give me a counter example at the time like equals three. Yeah, like t if t is three, y at three you need u s you need u at six. I mean nine, you need u at nine, right? So you need like a future value. So you have to be careful with the memory list, but you can always plug in time. You just want so something like this this is the only one that's gonna be this is the only one that's gonna be memory list. Memory list here, the other ones are not considered memory list in terms of the system, right? So you can think about this could be just delay or advancing, right? And it doesn't work here. You could have just a constant, some kind of time scaling, and it could even be a reversal, right? It could be any kind of constant where you have to be careful with that. And you can make up a lot of other examples, but you just have to check in terms of the system, right? We're looking to see does the output only depend on that. <laughs> Current value. So this one is kind of a subset of the next one, which, is, which we would actually see more. And this this one would be a polygon system. And we kind of we talked a little bit about. Oh yeah, question. Any questions? So memory um, systems are only does they consist of only existing circuit network? They can't consist of LC complex. Oh, so as long as you can, in this case, if the system could be anything, not just a circuit, right? You could have mass damper, and but this is in a general sense that I'm just writing a very simple mathematical expression. But this could be your rocket, or this could be, you know, this could be your insane robot. Right? So the output, in this case, I'm also doing single input, single output, just to get the concept, but we could have multiple input, multiple outputs. In terms of this, just looking at the output for, you know, in terms of the single input, single output, the output is a function of the input. The system does something to the input. We just want to know, is it memory or not? And you're just kind of looking, well, do I only need current time? And this is probably a very small subset of systems, right? Because most systems probably need to keep track of some past time, and do some differentiation or integration, right? So things like that. 
So in terms of service, it would be as long as you have like the first one, you could easily build a circuit with an amplifier, right? Where you could have like a, if you had a one half, it could just be an RLC kind of you know a voltage divider type of circuit. Or something. <clears throat> the time the time delay stuff you would have different you know, you build those circuits too. But then that would be considered benefits. <laughs> So this is more of a, so this is more of a uh, characteristic of your system. Looking at what type of systems we uh, that are nice to work with, or that we usually see that as practical. So a causal system. So here, this would be the output. Uh, so here, this is an output. Uh, y of t. Uh, in this case, uh, depends only on. on the uh, present and past. <laughs> present and past really values of the input are more, more specific. Uh, so what does this mean? This means uh, this means no no future I'll think of here. I can use this space here for example. So you're really saying it doesn't depend on future values of the input. Kind of makes sense if you think about practical systems, right? Kind of mentioned this a little bit last week. We're talking about like that bank account you know, or the example where you know causal systems are pretty much all the practical systems we'll work on in engineering. Uh, if you could get a future value of your input. Right? We would all be rich because if you think about the stock market, you think about the price of stock tomorrow, and then I'll decide which stock I'm going to buy today. Right? So, but in, uh, in all practical uh, you know, systems, we think about well, you're having, you're taking measurements, you're storing them, and then your your controller, or your, your in terms of a system point of view, you're going to be doing something with all these measurements that you have. You know, maybe you're doing it. Maybe maybe you are doing it just every time step, or maybe you're calculating. You know, keeping a couple values of your, or maybe you're looking at over you know a whole year before you figure out what the output is going to be. Right, in terms of a feedback control, if you're trying to maybe adjust something. So in these types, so here, so some examples here, we can kind of look at the. The same type of thing if you do that. So if we look at the, so like the first one here, all memoryless systems have to be puzzles of present, right? So that you're okay there. What about the second one here for in terms of this being causal? So this is a delay system, right? So at any time t, I needed, in this case, these are these are past values, right? So like pocket one is you know, minus two, right? So I needed, you know, like two days ago the input to calculate today's value. So this so this, these type of delay systems would be so causal would be like, you know, any kind of delay. So part t is this u of t minus three. So this would be causal. But what if we went the other way, you know, u of t plus three? Right, so you can think these are kind of simple time shifting examples. Make sure you're going the right way to get it has to be public. So this one would not be public. You would be you would have to have a future value of your input. It's an advanced system. Um, and then so these are just more kind of examples. So if you do also like the set the what about this example with um, so this one would be opposite. What about the example the the time so time shifting? Are you careful if you're going forward or backward? What about time scaling? Like that this, this example here in terms of this, it's not um, memoryless, but is so would you say that like would it be causal? <clears throat> so if we look at that example again, what do you think on that? Like why t is u three t or something? Yeah. It really depends on over what uh, interval your function is defined. Ah, so all t, all t, all this is all t, all t. <laughs> I'm not writing a formal definition here. I'm kind of 
I'm going to talk really quick. We can look at the, the notes or the book that. So this is for all T, right? So let, that's, that's actually a very good point because, and I get this question a lot. I should have, you know, raised that question all T in terms of that definition. Because you could say, oh, it's well, you know, it's causal over this section of time. But we're talking about the system, not just the signal. So that's one thing you can kind of see. Kind of all the talk, it's a property of the system, not just the signal over a certain period. Okay. So that's one thing. Because causal, so I'm talking about causal system. Signals can be causal. Okay. So in that, in that case, so if we look at something like this, so if I do this one, like U of, so if YT is, uh, So in this case, you have to look at it. Uh, you can say, well, does it depend on you know, present and past? But you can always put in a, an example. If you put, put in that t equal to 1, right, then y at 1 is u of t. So that's a future value. Right? So that would be, you have to be careful. So if you're shift, shifting plus or minus, just be careful. You're always going the right direction if you're going to check causality. If you're time scaling, you're pretty much, uh, it's, it's going to be a problem. It's not going to be in terms of being causal, right? <clears throat> you can even think that, like, if you, if y of t is some, uh, in this case, some, like, if it's time reversed, it's the same, same problem, like, right? you can have, like, a u of minus t or something. You can start playing around with a lot of, a lot of different examples. Um, so, okay, so that would be kind of, any questions on the causality? So it is for all t, right? Yes. So considering the last two expressions, those two sets, what's the difference between the between the system? So it's the same line. Well, these are just so I'm talking about properties of your system. So you could say a, a characteristic of your system. If, if you have, let's just say it's you have a system that's just an amplifier. You have an off amp in there and it's giving some some you know four times the input, right? Yeah, so so the you could say yeah, you could say the system is more or and console if you want to say both. Okay. But like the this well so this one there it's not going to be right so for both. So this this if the system is a doing some kind of time scaling to your input. So you're playing around with time, you're stretching or squeezing time, right? So you think about that, that's kind of a, a red flag because you're, if you're messing around with time scaling, it's like you're going into a different world uh, in terms of, you know, we're, we're, we have linear time in our world, practical world, engineering speaking, right? So when you start doing this, you're, you're like speeding up and slowing down systems, right? So it, it kind of gets, you know, it, would, it wouldn't have this prop, nice property of being a practical system. So you would say this. If, if this were our system, if it were speeding up time or, or slowing down time, it would not be a memoryless system and it would not be a causal system. That's a characteristic that I see you say. If I gave you a system, you can say it's a memoryless system. Sometimes you can, if you can prove it, you know, for all time, or if, it, if it's not used by a counter example, you can easily prove that it's not by a counter example. Does that make sense? Yeah, so these are properties of systems. Aren't all uh, memory lace systems causal systems? Yes. Okay. Because this is only, uh, you, you need just the present value, you're going need present, oh, it could depend on present and past. It doesn't have to depend on both, right? I mean, it could just all be past. Like for, in this case, this one is. It's not. So here I could add, you know, I could add this, this I could add something like this, like, right? I could say u of t minus 2 plus u of t minus 1 plus u of t, right? So this could be your system, and it's still causal because it just depended on the present, and these are all past values of the input, right? So that could be... That. So when I say only depends, it doesn't mean it has to... It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to have this... I could just say, okay, you know, in this case, it just depended on today's value or uh, today's output depending on what happened three days ago. So a non-causal system, like a, a real non-causal system would be more like in, if you think about in, uh, like, uh, 
image processing, you have, say you have an image, pixels, right? And you have to, in this case, we're talking about time going forward from some time, maybe, or time negative infinity to infinity, so then positive time. But if you, had, if you had an image and you're trying to talk about that in terms of like input output, you have to pick like where's your like origin, right? Or where's your where you're starting your sequence, and then you would go kind of like backwards and forward in time. So you could kind of see there are real life examples of non-causal systems. So these are two properties which would which would we're going to be using. And, and for all sense, you know, in, in this class we'll talk about systems that are causal. So we don't know future values of our input, right? So we're thinking more like like um, so the next one will be a time for this time invariant. So for this case, we want to find out is the system time varying or is it time invariant? So we'll see in this class, like I said, a lot of the tools to learn, these are going to talk about time varying systems. It's okay for the state space to have time varying. Linear time and or in time invariant systems, we'll talk about linear time invariant because that's a special case of all these characteristics. will be a lot nicer to work with because we can do a lot more algebra and then you can use you know, MATLAB. So we think about this in terms of looking at the you know, system. If you have a few hundred input going into your system, in this case, oh, did I get this confused? Oh, I did. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna make sure I keep this thing because sometimes I'll write like input x. So here, this is so this is our system, right? And then we're going to think about well, what happens if I do this uh, time shift on the input? Right. So if it's the case, we have this t minus t naught for some t naught. Say if I shifted the input. Right? If we look, if we look at the system, you put u of t in and you get y t out. Then you want to say what happens. If I put a shifted value into the system, and then is the output the shifted value of that, right? So in this case, you would have if this this would be just your regular system. So if this happens, where you have if the output is just the shift, same shifted value, then that would be called time invariant. So this would be called time invariant system. So this is just your maybe you're like given. So in this case, you're given an input-output pair. If you have y of t goes in, you get or u of t goes in, you get y of t. Now, if I shifted the input by, say, in this case, I can put a, a delay, but it could be something else also. But say I looked at, in this case, moving the time, just delaying it, right? Well, your system should still do the same thing, right? So it should still be the same robot. Doesn't matter if I'm going to apply the voltage now, or if I'm going to wait five seconds and apply it. The system should still do the same thing, right? And so the output you would expect to just look like what I had, you know, the output if I put the same input in. So if you look at this, it's kind of like you're looking at this. Does that make sense? We can look. We can try to figure this out. If you look at this a little bit more in terms of in terms of steps. So if we look at this as a uh, if I call this, um, uh, here I want to call this like a, if I use the operator T here for this. So in this case, we would look at how, how would you do a test for this. So if we know that uh, if we find, like the first step, when you find that Y, so Y, y of T, you know what Y of T is in terms of U of T. And then what you would do, you look at this the system operator on the U of T minus T naught. And then what you would do is then you would shift uh, to take the original output that you give and shift that. And then the fourth thing is you would compare. And here you would say the question is does 
uh, y of t minus t naught equal the system operating on u of t minus t naught. So this is kind of the, the test for um, for time sharing. So if we kind of look at it this way, we're kind of looking at well, it's a little bit easier to prove some of these. If I give you a system in terms of y of t as a function of the input, like even some of these up here that we that we worked on, right? And then I say, okay, so that's kind of a given. So I have to give you a system, right? So it's kind of step one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to so, so in this case you're given the input output. Right? Then you take the input and you shift it and put it through the system. And what do you get? So you don't know what you're getting yet over here, right? So in that case, so maybe we can actually write this as uh, if I think if I fix the picture, I can write this as the system we'll call it the operator t operating on u of t minus t naught. Right, so that's probably a better way to write it. So you're given the system, shift the input, put it through the system. And the output is this, right? It's whatever the system is, I just use operator t. Then what you have to do is then you shift the original one. So then we want to take the, this original one, shift it, and then compare it to the sequence. So basically you're, you're saying that if, if I just shift my input, the system should be doing the same thing. To that input, right? So if you look at that. So let's look at some examples because this would be in terms of doing doing this in terms of like if we just looked at uh, so we're talking about time invariance. So like if we looked at uh, five T is uh, if we just look at another amplifier system, say. So in terms of the block diagram, I put U of T in, I get two times U of T coming out. Right? So then I would look at taking uh, that would be the first step. And then the step, so that's kind of a given. And then I would look at the system operating on, in this case, U would say T minus T naught for some given T naught. But T naught's arbitrary. So what is the system doing to the input? It's just amplifying. So you're going to say, okay, it's taking whatever the input is and it's just amplifying. So this is just going to be 2 U of T minus T naught. So it's just amplifying, multiplying whatever it, whatever it sees by 2. Right? So that would be the second step. Then the third step, so now we're going to take the Y of T from up there and we're going to shift it by the same T naught. So I just plug in for T, I plug in um, T minus T naught. So that goes to just take the original one, I just shift in it. So then I just kind of plug it in. And then the fourth one is you compare. So you compare, you're comparing the these two here, really, right? You're comparing those two. And so you look to see are these two equal? And yes, they are. Right? So then the system would be coming back. So that's how you would know the system would be time invariant. I like to go through these steps so you can kind of see, or if you, if you want to do it visually, you would kind of look at this, and then and then what you're doing is you're comparing. This, uh, so does this equal you know, like t minus t? So that's how we do it. Kind of so if we look at something, what if we looked at? So this example, what if we looked at a different one? Let's see. Um, so this would be. Uh, number one, if you're given uh, t, t. So you're thinking about this, you know, I'm running this in terms of simple functions, right? But we can think about it as a system, right? So what is the system doing in this case? What's the system doing to the input? It's varying the time, right? So I give the I give the system some signal. And what's the system gonna do? It's gonna multiply this. So that's all the system's doing, right? So it knows, you know, who's time. So you have that. So let's look at these kind of these steps here. So if we go, and then, so the step two would be this. So here's T is my operator representing the system. So I want to look at what is the operator, what is the system doing to a shifted 
Now I take the input and I shift it. Well, the, the system is still going to multiply whatever it sees by T. Right? Does that make sense? So it just sees a blob coming in, some signal or whatever, and it just puts T and multiplies T by that thing. So if you look at that, so this this then should just be T times the input. Well, the input is just U of T minus T naught. Right, so it's just T times whatever the input is. Right, so, that. so then we take the next step, we take the output Y of T, and we have to shift it. So y of T minus T naught. Well, Y of T is this. So wherever we see T, we get a shift. Put in T minus T naught. So this would be T minus T naught, uh, U of T minus T naught. Does that make sense? So I'm like trying to keep keep track with that. And so then the fourth the fourth step we do is comparing. Right? So we're comparing these two and to oh well not equal. Right, so then so this is not. So in this case it's time varying. Time varying system. So that makes sense. So these are kind of just two two examples here. To just, I, I think going through the steps in this case is, is uh, probably an easier way to uh, do it. So if you so again, if we're talking about a, a property, a characteristic of time with your system. So if we start, um, and in this case, the time invariance means it's a shift in time. Right? We're just shifting. But if I start doing something where I uh, multiplying your input by another function of time, that's a problem. Right? That's what I'm doing here. Or if you're going to do some kind of time scaling, like squishing and stretching time, like different, you know, time, time warping, that would be a problem, right? Because you can kind of go through the same steps and anything like that. But if you're just doing like time delaying or advancing, well, we're just, in this, we're just shifting in time anyway, so it would be a problem. So there's a lot of examples. I'm not going to go through all of them because there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, tricky ones. You can think of you know, right, very simple ones. So you could think of you know your system's an integrator that does you know between certain limits and you know so you can do kind of play around with those two. Any questions on this type of? Uh, so we can use a similar kind of steps. So, so far we have this memoryless causal. Um, and then uh, time invariant. We can start. <clears throat> These ones are important. And then the last one is the property of being linear. So we can actually use a similar test as we have. Uh, and then the idea is then we can put together this linear time invariant together to get our nice linear system. Okay, so then this would be so we'll look at full linear system. So, so in this case, we would have, uh, we can think about having like U1 of T going into your system uh, and giving the output Y1 of T. And then we can have another input that is Q and giving you Y2. So two different inputs giving you two different outputs. This is the system. We want to say, well, is this system linear? So to do the linearity test, we need two different inputs. So in terms of the what what why do we need that? Why do we need these the properties? What you want to see is you want to have that okay, you would have some constants A that you want to plus B Q of T. If you put now put that into the same system, uh, and then what you want to check is that you get this uh, a by one of t plus b by two. So if this is true, so then this would be this would be linear. So 
So if it's not true, then you have a nonlinear system. Right? So if you look at this, I kind of combine this. I use this property of superposition. Right? But what do we have here? So we actually have, I'm, I'm actually combining two, two separate things here. And this would work with multiple inputs, right? You have sum of all the inputs, weighted sum is the same weights on the sum of their corresponding inputs. Right? But here what I have is I have this property, I have additivity, right? So that's this one. So this would be like your additivity property. So you're here, here you're adding additivity. Right? And then all these over here, and this is your scale terms of properties. So to be linear, you think back to like just linear algebra, you have your know, scaling property has to hold, right? And the additivity property has to hold, right? Combining these two, I kind of wrote it all together. I wrote a weighted sum instead of doing one. So it has to be true also if I if I put u1 in and I get y1, you have to have if I if I just put a weight on U1, like some constant A, U1, you better get A times Y1 coming out, right? So that's the scaling property. The additivity property is if I put in two different outputs for their two inputs for their corresponding outputs, now if I add them, I should get these two added together, the corresponding outputs. Exactly, just added together, that's additivity. Writing it this way, I just kind of put it all in one. Does everyone see that? And then it can work for multiple inputs and outputs, right? And that's kind of what's called superposition. Is that clear? So, so this would be. So then, if, if this if this property holds, it's linear. So to show it's not linear, you, you can show that this doesn't hold, or you can just show that either the scalar additivity doesn't hold. So you can actually kind of cut your work in half. I can say, okay, if I put in, if you will give me y1, and I put 2u1 in, over here I get 4y1. Well, that's not linear. You just prove it. That would take the scaling field. You can see that's probably a squaring system. Or I can show additivity fields only like if I put these inputs in and get those, and if I just add these two together and it didn't give me y1 and y2, right? So this is kind of putting it all together. Is that, is that clear? So this would be the linear, linear property. Um, and then it works somewhere. I have, let's look at an example. Um, so here. Uh, so we can kind of do, oh, here I was going to do kind of a similar similar example. Let's look at this, uh, kind of what, what you would need to do here. I'm going to let, uh, well, I'm going to have my y of t is going to be equal to, here I'm going to take uh, the input. Uh, and square it. So already I'm telling you it's a squaring system. We know it's not going to be linear, right? But how do we actually how do we actually prove that? So we can have these similar four steps. So first I'm going to you know, give you the system. So then I know that y1 of t is the u1 of t uh, squared. And I know that y2 of t is my u2 of t squared. Right, so you're given the first one, and then you say, okay, let's look at two different input output pairs, right? So, so if we look at that, so that would be kind of like what we did, we kind of just what you're, what you're given, right? So in this case, let's, if we let this be the same system T, we'll call it like a T as an operator, right? And then what you want to do is you want to say, well, what is the system doing? I'm going to put the whole thing in system A. One of t plus b, two of t. Right. So here I'm just going to do the whole weighted combination of them. Right. I could I could show that this doesn't work for either attitude scaling. So now I'm saying, okay, here's our system. Now the system just seeing this input, right? So what is the system going to do to the input? Now all of this stuff is just call it input. The system is taking, so this is actually, so this, if I wrote it here, this is the system, what it's doing to an input, if I'm going to write it that way, in terms of operator. Right? So I give you a T, it's taking the input and squaring it. So now I'm giving it this other new input here, it's going to just square it. Right? So in this case, this is going to be all of this stuff 
a you want a t to be two of t all of the square. Right? And I can write that out. So then what you want to do is you want to look at then you want to, the third step, just like we did before. Now we want to look at the the we want to look at this linear combination of the outputs. So I'm going to look at the same a by one of t plus b by two of t. Okay, so what is that? So here we we, we know what y one and y two. So this is just a times this u one of t squared plus b u two of t squared. Right, so I just kind of plug in like the y one and y two. And then the same thing. So then the first the fourth step is you now you want to compare. You're going to compare these two, right? So does uh, the does the linear combination, corresponding linear combination of the same linear combination of the outputs, is that equal to the system operating on that linear combination of the inputs, right? So if you did the math out on this one, you would see it's not equal, right? It's not equal to that because you'll have cross terms, right? So this would be so this if you compare these, then um, this would be not uh, not linear. Or you can say um, non linear. Does that make sense? So this one is, you know, we knew it was non linear, but this one you would actually show it. So these steps are nice, kind of thinking about as a system, right? And what is the system doing to the input? So other examples that would be linear that some of the ones we already looked at, like just the amplifier, where you can see, well, that would be linear. Right? So this is Systems. Other things that are linear, like uh, differentiation, like differentiators, things like that. So I'll go through that in the next examples. Any questions, kind of just on the these prop properties of of systems? So what we're what we're going to be so, uh, in this class, we'll talk about uh, linear time varying systems uh, in, sort of in like a general sense, and then uh, linear time invariant systems, which are a lot nicer, and then we can actually have some nice tools, a nice map that we can see. So in that in that sense, but it, a lot of the techniques for, for, for linear time varying. There are a lot of books, the linear system theory books. I know there's like tons of them, but there's one. I think it's Kai Lam's book. Because all like the initial stuff is mainly they, they do different things like just single input, single output, and then later they'll do multi input, multi output. Some of them do just linear time varying, and linear time varying. Uh, so, and all, all of this works for multi and multi output operators too. Okay, so if we want to look at, we wanted to, the next thing we want to talk about is the, the impulse response for, for a system. But before we talk about just the, uh, the impulse response, which is going to be very important, then it ties to our transfer function, we want to look at what's the complete response to the system. So let me look at that. So if we look at this in terms of the, uh, so here so we're going to start. We're going to start this thing. We're going to have a linear system. We want it to be a linear system now. So now that we know the characteristics, we're going to focus on linear system for the rest of the class. We talk about nonlinear systems. Well, you're going to have to linearize it. Right, because then to use the tools that's similar like homework, you're doing like small angle approximations. If I give you an linear system, it's more complicated. That's what we saw before. You would have to do that Jacobian method to linearize around the equilibrium point before you use all like, the other tools that we're going to do as well for linear, linear systems. So, in this case, you can have the, the uh, in this case, the response of the, of the system. So, here we're going to have again, say, U of T going into your system. 
you want to see. I think we actually solve why two is certain in kind of the most general sense. So if we want to look at this, we're going to say that this is going to be, uh, I'm going to call this, uh, this is going to be y, uh, the zero input response plus y, uh, zero state response. So we have to define what these two things are. We're kind of breaking it up into kind of like what you would do solving like a differential equation. You look at the particular elements in the solutions, right? So in this case, if you look at a system, you can talk about these, these different, uh, these different uh, parts of the system. And we'll see that when we go forward and actually figure out in our state space when we're doing this, we'll see these two different parts of, of the system. So this one is called, the, and this one is the zero zero input response to of the system. And this is called the zero state response to this linear system. So I'm not saying if it's time variant or time variant, this is this is super. So when I say uh, zero input response, it's a response to what? What is the input? Zero. Yeah, absolutely zero. So that's all you have. To, so if you're a new, U of T is uh, alpha identically zero for you know for, for all something we'll see. Let's see triple line. Okay, some of this math, triple line will be like a quick one zero all the time. But this is so zero input response is response to the zero input. Well, that's kind of strange. Well, what is it? It's like the natural response to your circuit, right? So sort of charge up your circuit, shut off the input, see what happens. You see how it dissipates, right? Or in, in that case. So what is the zero state response? So there's the word state, right? That relates back to our states in the system. Oh, the state space. What are, so it's kind of a shorthand. It doesn't mean all your states are zero. It means your initial state. Zero. Okay. So it's kind of a short thing. So this means that, so this is your, uh, in this case, you would say that all the, uh, I would say that x at t0 zero equals zero. Uh, so this is your initial uh, states. So this x and here x of t is in. Uh, is in R, we'll say Rn. So it's a vector, right? So x of t, I guess we'll say, it's like x1 of t, all the way to xn. Mm. Right, so these are our states, right? Like for the cars, four states, alpha, alpha dot, xx dot, and then the, the angle of the inverted pendulum. Uh, and then you're just saying all, take the initial, the initial time, when I want to start my robot or start the system, I'm going to switch on is T on. And then I'm going to say it's initially at rest. That should be all our initial conditions are zero. It's actually an important condition, and the whole transfer function method is based on that. You'll see, because we're talking about transfer functions later, we'll talk about that. You'll see, well, it all reflects all the initial conditions have to be at rest before you even say how things are related. But the initial conditions are kind of, you know, it depends when you have different, you know, if you have the same system, I give you, you know, an initial condition, some kind of charged up capacitor or whatever, or charged up battery, and then you let your system go, right, you can see how it works. Or maybe you start with a different initial condition, uh, and you give it a different, uh, different input, you know, it depends on this input and in, in initial condition. So that so this is more terminology. Zero input, zero state response. So that's kind of the. And then when I when I do this, so it's kind of like you have. Uh, if we're already using the linearity property here, right? So I'm going to be using this additivity property, right? So if I put if I have a system, you know, you going in get the y and then put zero in. I put zero in, I get this one, right? And if I put u in with an initial condition, I get the second one, right? And then, I, and then I'm putting just the general u, and I can do that. 
So this would be this would be kind of the call the complete response of, of the system. So then okay, is that is that clear as what kind of looking at in terms of like it's almost analogous to this differential equation you have to have particular homogeneous <clears throat> solution. So this is a complete response. Let's look now at this uh, what is the uh, impulse response. That's another important. So the impulse response is very important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of any system. And as you, I mean, in practice, you, you find impulses. You put impulses into systems, and you see what they do. And then you can use that to then find out what the system's going to do for any other input, right? You think about that. We even do this like in the underwater uh, testing of systems. We'll get a huge like bang to see what the system does for this impulse. Impulse would be like a huge, you know, like, uh, symbols and fashion in an uh, orchestra or just a huge, uh, you know, impulse. You know, in practice, it's hard to do, right? Because they can be sound or larger voltage as long as you're not damaging the system. And mathematically, it's nice because we have this impulse function, right? So you have, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, input, is going to be what we call like delta t, right? This is your input it goes into your system, right? And then we can say the output. Uh, I'll I'll write the output. <laughs> um, so here I'll write the t. So this is the impulse. So when I say impulse response, it's just like over there when we said zero input response. It's the response when the input is an impulse. So it's direct delta or impulse. So it's hard to do in practice to have this like, you know, in these cases, you know, you can go, I'm not going to go over like all the properties, the area is one, right? So, and this define, you know, infinity at zero, zero everywhere else. <clears throat> Usually use it inside of integration. Use like evolution, things like that. So what we want to look at in terms of the, the in terms of our, our linear system, we want to say, well, how do we how do we come up with the uh, impulse response of our of our linear system in terms of this terminology here? And we're just going to look at the single input, single output, because it, it, we could do this for multi input, multi output. What happens? You just get a big matrix with all your single kind of point to point. Uh, uh, responses, the whole responses inside of <clears throat> So here we're going to look at, in this case also we're going to have the, uh, so here we're going to look at the SISO system, and then also it has to be the zero uh, state response. So these two, we're now looking at, looking at these two here. I have a quick question so, oh, yeah. about the previous topic. Oh. So just to wrap my head around it, last time we defined the error to be delta x mm -hmm. equals x of b minus x of x to the grip. Mm -hmm. Can you think of this uh, y, z, i as oh. the of the grip and the y, z, s is the x of b? Is it the similar sort of concept? Oh, wait, wait. So you're talking about when we did the linearization? Yeah. Ah, different topic. <laughs> I know this stuff, so the, okay, so linearization when you're using the delta, like thinking you know, of your little delta away from, or perturb your system a little delta, you see that, or you know, we'll say epsilon or delta or something like that. No. So this, I'm just, I'm using this notation here. This is what's usually used for impulse, sort of Dirac delta. But for this over here, you know, so this is just looking at in terms of what we were talking about, the properties of input output of a system. Now, if I put input in like an output, I'm just saying the output can always be decomposed into these two pieces. So we're going to see this when in, in, in the same space. We're going to show, show you that any our y of t, which we used all up there, that's given an input, find the output. What are the input output pairs? My output can always be decomposed into these two pieces where I look at, okay, what does the system do with no input? What does the system do? With uh, zero initial conditions, and then add those two together. That's your complete. That's what well, I'm calling complete. But that's mm -hmm. the y. That's right. 
So in, in, in this one, we start doing, when I put all this, I'm gonna put all this into state space terminology. We'll see that our output is gonna be two pieces added together. And then it's a matter of, okay, how do we uh, calculate this part? And then we gotta calculate that part, right? We'll see that. <clears throat> So uh, and so this is just more of a structural kind of, we'll see this is going to be broken up this way. So now we got to start figuring out what those two pieces are. So to do that, we need to look at this concept of uh, what is the impulse response. Uh, so in this case, this, so this one, I'm saying zero state response. So we're going to be kind of looking at this piece over here with, with this impulse response. Like I'm looking at the zero state here. So, uh, Okay, so maybe I could do, let's see, I have to do that. Uh, uh, maybe I have to do some other things. I'll use another Okay, so what we want to do then, this is kind of like, uh, how are we going to build this, what is this impulse response? We can kind of think of it as a response to all these uh, to the impulse, but we look at it. it relates a little bit to, um, like if we're talking about continuous time signals, and you sample them, right? So you have a signal, you sample to a sample hole, and then you sample fast enough, it kind of looks, you digitize the signal, right? But so kind of looks like the original signal, you digitize it very small, you know, samples like that. So that's kind of where, where this is going. So if we look at this, um, and here, so I'm going to draw this in terms of the, this delta function, in terms of uh, this kind of a, so I want to call this delta of, uh, of half delta, and it's going to be of t minus t1, say. So this is going to be some t1 here, or maybe, maybe zeros over here, it doesn't really matter. And then this is t1 plus half delta. The width of this is half delta, and the height here is one over half delta. So if we look at that in terms of a, uh, this is gonna be the, uh, we would call this the unit pulse, right? So this is kind of the, in this case, the unit pulse. So the, the delta T, if I look at this, so, so here the, if I look at what's the area under this curve of the unit pulse, it's come, it kind of gives it to you, right, the unit. It's just one, right, the area is one, right? So in the limit, as, as the delta goes to zero, we get the direct delta function, the remnants of that. So this can kind of see, we're kind of going to use this unit pulse to kind of represent your signal. And then we're going to let the cap delta, the sampling step, the time go to in, go to zero, right? and then we'll be in this back into the just looking at the delta function. Okay, so we're kind of building this, and then so then you can say, well, then what do you have? Then every every input. So now we're going to look at our input U of t. Uh, say say your input something like this, right? Uh, Maybe this is your U of T. Every input can then be, you just do this kind of sample uh, hold, right? And then sample hold, these type of sample holds. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to digitize a signal, right? So this is continuous time, kind of in this case, sample hold. But in this case, I'll, I'll start at the same zero. So then there's some kind of, you know, I'll call this ti, and then this is ti plus that cap delta. So this is one cap delta. And then this uh, piece here, we're going to call u of ti. So what it what that u of ti, so this would be kind of I shaded in a little bit, this piece here, is just the, is just the pulse, you know, weighted by U of the input input U of uh, at point T I. We're gonna we're gonna do a bunch of these, right? So everyone see that? So U of T I and hold it for a cap delta time. So you can say that all these inputs can be approximated in this way, right? In terms of these a series of pulses goes on and on and on. 
So then what we have is that we have, uh, how can we then, if we want to represent your signal U of T, your input, then it's approximately equal to, say, the sum, um, all of these sums over, uh, over, over all of I, uh, U of T I um, times of T minus T I, and then we have to times the capital T there. <clears throat> so you can write this continuous time function. So here you're doing all I, you know, in this case, uh, I is minus infinity to infinity, the whole, the whole thing. I can approximate my input this way. Right? So what you're doing is you're saying it's, it's kind of like U at T I is this value that's held times that pulse, which is of height, one over cap delta, multiplied by cap delta, you get, you're kind of canceling the height, but get one, right? So everyone see that? So this is just looking at in terms of the, I can write my, my U of T this way, approximately. So then you want to let the, uh, so then what want, then you want to do is you want to let this G, well, let this G cap delta of T, and uh, be the output. In this case, uh, that time t uh, from the input, in this case, uh, and u of t is just equal to this delta of half delta of t minus ti. Uh, so this is uh, this is applied uh, at uh, ti. So it's really so now we're looking at two times. So you're looking at this kind of breaking this down, and you're saying, okay, here's this. Uh, we're putting this into the system, right? So this is like in case t minus uh, in this t one. We just try to choose ti. So we have this pulse going into your system. And we're saying, well, then the output is this, this little g delta. I'll call it that, right? Okay. So it's kind of like the response to the pulse. I'm going to call this g, g of delta. Does that make sense? The approximation for you, t, how did you get the response? Uh, so approximately. Well, so so what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm saying, in this case, the uh, this, this, if I look, first if I look at this delta function here, this, the t minus ti is t minus ti. This is a height, one over cap delta. If I multiply it by cap delta, you, this is really just one. Right? And so you're basically saying that u is just equal to all these things, you know, all these pieces. Put them, stack them together. Well, I'm, I'm not adding these. I'm not adding this to this to this to this. I'm taking this pulse and then this pulse. And adding this pulse, and adding this pulse, and this pulse. You see, and that approximately will look like uh, this function. I can make it a different color. So this is this is our original function here. Okay. It's kind of like I'm just building. How do I, how do I approximate that continuous function? I can approximate the continuous function by these pulses stacked next to each other, right? Both, both ways, and it's a, really a sample and hold. Well, how do I write that? I'm going to use the shifted, the shifted delta. So where is this, this? These deltas are shifted, right? So this happens when t is equal to t i. This delta happens, right? Everywhere else is zero. So what you're, what you're basically getting is what I just wrote in that, that equation there, I'm saying that u of t is approximately equal to uh, this piece plus uh, you know this piece. So this is like zero to one, say one to two, right? And then I have another piece over here, two to three, right? <clears throat> That's what that is. And they'll represent how do you represent, you know, given this, how do you represent that is you're multiplying by a shifted, the shifted delta function. I don't want to go too much into that because it's kind of like a kind of like a so if you want to look at before I go from here, so this would be this would be delta t at zero, and then this is delta of say t minus one is at one, right? And if I do 
delta of p minus 2 happens at 2. Okay. You remember this from, this from your math class, right? Because the delta happens by definition, like if the delta of 0 is 1. It's, I mean, it's the delta function. Right? With this infinite height in area 1. So delta t is here. This only happens when t is equal to 1. So it happens at t equal to 1. Right? This happens at t equal to 2. Everywhere else is 0. So I use this concept of the property of the deltas in this, just to be able to add these pieces together. That's what that is. Does that make sense? So basically, I took, I'm taking these, taking your signal U of T, breaking it up into pulses, taking them as all my huge infinite number of in inputs now, because of linearity, I know weighted sum of all those is going to be equal to the weighted sum of here, right? Because it's linear, what we just talked about. So now I'm letting this G notation here be the output for one of those pulses, right? So if you look at that in terms of the, in terms of that. So, so what are we saying here? We have, then we have that, so we have that one of the pulses, uh, T, a minus T I, this, this gives you, you know, it goes through the system, right? This will give us G delta of uh, T, uh, where did I write it? T and T I. So that's just one pulse that gives me that. Right, so now I can do by linearity, I know that I can do this weighted. I can put a weight on it. What's the weight going to be? It's going to be this U of Ti delta. So if I put that into my system, well, I never get the same scale on the output, right? That's part of our linearity property. So then I should have G delta T Ti. U of T I. Delta. Does that make sense? So we're kind of building. So that's just using the scaling property. And then I can use the additivity. So here I did the scaling property. And then I can use the additivity property. So now I can take a sum of all these. I'll use this notation. Delta. T e minus Ti. Yeah. All these. Uh, 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 right? So if I put this now, this whole sum of those weighted delta pulses through over here, I should get the same sum because of linearity. You get the scaling and, and additivity property. So then over here, you get the same sum of these G uh, delta. So that's just a linearity property. So I'm kind of saying, okay, put a pulse in, you get this thing we're calling G delta out. Put weighted pulse in, well, it better be the same weight on the output. Scaling. Take a whole sum of these things, it better be the same sum of those weighted ones, right? And that's kind of in the picture earlier, input, we're just breaking it up into all these pulses to do that. So then if you look at them, so in this case then, this. So this would then be your output, right? We call this y. So that's the output. Uh, can then be approximated, right? If you think of an input U of t, we approximated the input doing the sampling, some sampling method, sample hold, right? And you expect to get the, the sum. And then what you do is you let, uh, let this delta go to zero. So our sampling rate gets faster and faster and faster. The pulses go into becoming just a single function, right? <clears throat> so then we get that this ha what happens is that your delta t minus ti goes to delta of t minus ti. So again, this is just going to be some pulse happening at ti. So there's your delta function. It's only happening at that one point, right? And then you can say that this G, we can look at this G delta, ETI, uh, we'll just go to G of ETI. So again, this notation here, so we kind of, these are all not continuous, right? So it's the 
we were saying that's the uh, output at time t when the input supply to ti. And then the output y of t then goes to uh, this integration g of t. Uh, I use tau, u of tau, tau. So, so in this case, the tester can be so. So then, this would be your output, right? So, in the most general sense, we're talking about it could be linear to invariant, could be linear to time invariant. This would be your output. What does that look like? We talked about it before in terms of this integration and having. Transform. Convolution, yeah. Well, convolution would be for linear time invariant, right? So this is this is the most general form. This could be LTV or LTI, linear time invariant or linear time invariant. You need to know what this this function G is this response, right, to, to all these things. Right? So then you can have special cases. Well, if it is LTI, right? So then uh, so this this is called the this is called the impulse. Uh, uh, so the impulse response is your, so this would be your impulse response. So the G of T, T, I is your impulse response in the most general sense, meaning linear time varying or time invariant, right? So if you have, if you have that, and then this would be like a convolution, and then, then there are, uh, I'm already here, we'll take, we'll take a little break. Just to do kind of going a little bit more on the specifics if it's causal. So, if you have a causal system, um, then you can say that y of t is equal to uh, just t naught to t of this g of t tau. You would always just use tau. In this case, the causal system, you have, in this case, g of t tau equals zero t less than tau. So you can kind of plug that in there and you end up getting that, that, that this is true. And then, uh, what else you can say? Oh, so then you have it as time, if you add time invariant, if you have a time invariant system, you can even further simplify this, right? So then you end up hitting the one of t is zero to t. Uh, oh, wait, two, 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 two. well, time, add, add time invariance to this one, right? Then you get the g of t minus tau, u of tau, t tau. So this is what you have to see what we talked about before. This would be the composition. So that kind of shows just in this case we're building in this case the, the time the time invariant uh, causal system you can figure out the the output for it in, in this case to do that. Okay, so why don't we take uh, let's take a little break and then we'll so then I'm sorry to talk a little bit. If this if this seems a little bit some some of this is probably background math that but I just make sure we we can go and um, I can give you references for some of this stuff too.
when we look at the system, and we, we're really looking at you know, input output analysis. You know, give me an input, I gotta find the output. And we're looking at most of those things. So it's linear uh, time invariant or time varying. But now let's focus just on the time linear time invariant case to see it, and, and then also causal system. So in this case, then we can start talking about transfer functions, and then we want to see really on the next like half hour. So we'll talk more about like what is this? How does a transfer function relate to the state space model, which we were talking about right, in terms of that? And then we're going to be starting to use just the state space model. But we're going to kind of look at look at what's the you know connection between the two. So here I wrote our system as causal LTI. So the G of T, right, that's our impulse response, right, so that was from our, the G of T is your impulse response, this one here. And that's kind of what we were just talking about, how we actually kind of built it up from the pulse system. Right? And then this G of S, this is your, in this case, this is your transfer function. And these two, right, once you have the impulse response, right, or the transfer function, it describes the whole system. So we're looking at that. So when we're talking about, so we're saying it's in this case we're going to say it's linear uh, time invariant, right? So in this case we're going to have uh, looking at. Uh, Using the impulse response to the transfer function, and they're related to each other, right? So this is just the Laplace transform formula. I can take the Laplace transform of any signal, right? Using these formulas, kind of here it has zero because it's causal, right? So in that case, you're looking at the signals are zero before um, time is equal to zero. So this would be how the transfer function and impulse response are related. But you can use either one. Right, to find the output, right? So if in, in case of looking at where the different methods, right, so you could find, you know, given, so given a U of T, uh, right, you want to find uh, Y of T. Find y of T. So this is really the basic input-output analysis you do in, in the system, right? So in this case, well, what do we know? Well, if you know G of T, or do you know the class transform of it, or maybe you know the transfer function, right? And you maybe you can just use, use that method, right? So, what are the different methods? So, one way you can say, well, if we can use convolution in the time domain, so yt, that would be uh, what we have this in terms of, well, here I'm going to write this as t naught to t, in this case, um, g of t naught to tau, we wrote tau to tau, right? So, this is the Convolution, right? So we can use convolution here. Right, and that's a pure time domain method, right? So this could be difficult to do this, right? So if you think about how do you actually compute this, it really depends what's the function g, what's your input, it can be very complicated. Uh, and then if you actually are uh, talking, we'll talk about uh, single input, single output, but this could also be multiple input, multiple output. Right? And using this method can be very difficult to use this, right? Uh, and, and it also depends on, you know, this is continuous time calculation. Well, you're, you're going to use a computer to do it, and it digitizes things that, you know, it depends on all the methods that you have inside the computer, too. So Professor? convolution is one way. Just, yes. Just looking at that, why would you use convolution? Would me the, the transfer function be easier? Yeah, no, I'm talking about different methods. Yeah. Oh. So the next method, right? So that's the next method to use. You could use a transfer function method. Right? So then how do you how would you do that? So here you would take like what we did before, you would say that y of y of s is g of s, not u of s, right? But then I have to then then the second step you have to do, you have to say that my t is the the Laplace inverse, say, of one mass, right? So you have to do this inverse Laplace transform, but there are tables, right? You can you can use this. So that's kind of a, the <clears throat> two methods you probably have already learned, right? So we kind of know this, and, and it, they're they're related because this G of T 
and G of S are just Laplace transform related, right? The impulse response and transform related in terms of that. Uh, so, th so you could do it this way, but then you have to go back through the inverse Laplace transform, and again, you're doing this all, you know, basically doing that in the computer. So the way we want to, the, the method we're going to talk about is the state space method. State space method. So that would be what we talked about already, where you have, you know, the y of t uh, is going to be, in this case, you could think about it in terms of, well, we're going to, I'm going to do LTI. So we see uh, x of t plus d. So this would be a lot easier because you're, in this case, where we have to uh, find, uh, just multiply whatever you have x of t times this constant matrix, and then if you have a you know, over here, the d, right? So sometimes you have the d. And we saw we were working with this in math lab last week already. The problem here is to find out what x of t is, right? So we'll learn some different methods that actually solve x of t for that. But this is kind of in general, we have, you know, these are kind of methods that we could do this input output analysis, right? You can choose. But in this class, we think, well, we have a you know, linear time invariant systems. We already have this nice state space representation, right? So we can think about looking at how to actually do this. So before we do the actual solving, uh, which involves you know looking at the zero input response, adding the zero state response to it, probably we're going to end up doing that next week. Uh, we want to look today with the relationship between this transfer function and the state space. Right, because then in MATLAB we'll see this is very easy to do. So if you can kind of go between the transfer function and state space, like when if you're if you're given the transfer function, right, and then and, and that would only be point to point, you might be given a whole bunch of transfer functions, right? So point to point, like single input, single output, then there's a way to put that into state space. So maybe that's an easier way to solve in terms of your computation or different whatever you're doing. Or if you're given state space. You may want to go to the transfer function. So there's an easy way to figure out how do you get to how do you compute the transfer function if you have a state space model, and then if you have a transfer function, how do you write that in state space? So this would be very useful to look at. So the first thing we want to do is say, okay, let's look at if we have the state space model, how do we actually find the transfer function? So this is the equation. So we're going to look at going from the uh, so here will be for state the state space. Uh, to the transfer function. How do we actually look at this? So, so what was our state? Our state space right now had this x dot, this a x, this a u. Let me let me put my t in the x dot t. And then y is c x of t. Uh, and then, so this is your state space. So here x, right, so we'll say x is in Rn, it's a vector, x1 through xn, different states in your system you're keeping track of, because what this is nice for, right? Uh, you can say u is in, uh, usually for k, k inputs, and then there are uh, m outputs. So this could be, it's a nice representation when you have multiple input, multiple outputs. So and uh, okay, so this. So how do we get this into state into the transfer function method, right? Well, if you remember from the Laplace transforms, we have so we have this derivative in there, the derivative operator in Laplace transform. So we use that property. The other ones are just additivity and scaling for, for doing things, right? So here we're going to take the Laplace transform of everything above, and so you get s. Uh, I'm going to x of s. Minus x is zero. It's going to be a x of s plus b uh, mu of s. So I took the first equation, taking the Laplace transform, the derivative. First derivative goes to s times x of s. So x of t goes to x of s. Just like this, I use this. You're pretty much using this this formula here. Okay? So I put x of t in there. I get x of s. Okay? 
if the derivative is property, we're going to go through the one, the class transform has whole tables of properties in here. The first derivative gives you s times x of s, but then you have to take away the initial condition as it's zero. That's x t at time t equals zero. It's like the second derivative, you would have three terms. You would have s squared x of s minus some uh, times the x of s and so go on. Uh, and then the other ones are just these are constants, a and b, and then x of t of the whole class transform u. Is that clear? And then we do the second, the second equation at y s. It's just there's no derivative. So here we just have c and s. Let's see. So here we took our first order differential equations, and those are vectors, but we're in compactly we're writing this in the depth of x. Uh, and we put it into algebra by using the little class transform. That's the beauty of a class transform. So we went from time domain to frequency domain. So we went from differential equations to algebra. Right, so what do we do here? We got to combine like terms. Right, we can actually think around them. <clears throat> we want to come up with an expression for this, right? So we want to say, well, what is, in this case, if we, we can write y of s, and then you can read off what is the, the g is just the y divided by u, right? Output over input in, in the um, transfer point. Output over input in, in the <coughs> Okay, so here we have to do something. We have to just do a little algebra where you combine terms. Uh, <coughs> this in terms of the, uh, so we have these two, right? So if we can combine the s here. So to do that, we would say si minus a uh, times S where I is the identity matrix. So here we're talking about uh, what is the A, what is the A matrix? So we maybe we should talk about if this if X is an RN, A this A is N by N matrix, right? We got a big N by N matrix for A. Because so we're talking in state spaces only. Right? And then in the in the B you have the N by K, right? So these are all either uh, all the ABCs are matrices here for how many inputs So in terms of doing this, it's S, X of S, and then you're subtracting A times X of S. Well, you have this S is just the little class, the operator. It's a complex number, sigma plus J omega, right, on a complex plane. It's a single complex number point, but you have to get it into the matrix form. So S times I is the identity matrix with S is on the back. Right. So it's just the identity to S, you just get into that S. So that, that's how you would combine that matrix wise to get that. Does everyone see that? It's more like some little review on the, the living number. So then you're in, ending up, what do you end up on the other side? You end up with uh, uh, X and 0 plus the E, right? Um, <clears throat> But I, what I want to do is I want to write this in terms of the x of s. So then what I'm doing here, right, this si minus a, as a diagonal of s's minus the big a matrix, is a matrix, right? So i got to invert it. You can invert it, right? Because it's not going to be 0, which would be that obvious. S is on the diagonal. So this is going to be si minus a inverse x of 0, the initial condition, plus the S i minus a inverse v u of s. So that gives me this. Uh, so here, this gives me my, uh, you know, this x and s expression, right? Well, I want to find y of s, so I got to plug that in. We're going to plug. This is going to be plugged in here in terms of the in the uh, well, not there, sorry, oh, in this one here. Right, going into the S, um, X of S in the Y of S equation. So then if we do that, so we're plug that into the, the Y of S, then you can kind of see here, uh, if I write this in terms of so what if Y of S is then going to be C times X of S. So C times this SI times A inverse. Um, X and zero. Let's see, plus, uh, well, let's 
Trustees who may help us all here. What's the C uh, times SI times A inverse uh, B U of S? Plus, and then you have plus that D U of S. <coughs> Does everyone see that? I just plugged in. You're just plugging in this expression into the x of s, right? So it's kind of, now we're kind of working with matrices here, right? So then if I kind of look at this a little bit differently, I end up with a C S I plus A inverse uh, X F <coughs> zero plus in this case I have uh, C S I minus A inverse B plus D all times U of S. So that's your y of s. So what is the, what has, first of all, notice it has two parts. Right, so we're talking about that complete response before. So we have one part here. What is this part here? So if I look at this part here, and I look at this part separately, these two parts separately, right? So what do you see in terms of the, this first part for y of s has nothing to do with the input, right? So if the input were zero, that's what we would get, right? So that's called the zero, that's the response called zero input response, right? So that's the zero. This would be the zero input. Response. So it's response to the zero input, you know, then I have to, in this case, you would take the, uh, that would be y of s, do the inversal fast transform, you find y of t, which would be the y zero input. And then the other piece over here is going to be your zero state response. And that just means zero, remember, zero initial state. That the initial state isn't there. Because if x is zero, that's x of t is equal to zero. So initial state, right? Well, here I'm using, I'm using zero instead of t. Let t not be zero. Uh, then y of s would just be the second part here, for this would be zero. And you would end up with this. And then do inverse plus transform, you'll find the zero state response of your system. Add these, adding these two together gives you the complete response. So you can kind of see what we were talking about before, but here we're talking, looking at it in terms of the the um, the estimate, right? So look at this. So if we we can actually give some notation here, which we'll see later. This is kind of like uh, so. This is kind of this big psi. Why that they use the psi of that? x is 0 plus, in this case, this is g of s, um, u of s. So notation-wise, we'll see this later, but that c si minus a inverse, just those matrices multiplied together that way, right? You look at it, uh, is the psi of s. And there's our g of s, so that's our transfer function. So transfer function is when you have the zero initial conditions, by your zero initial conditions, you can find your transfer function. All we did, you take away zero initial conditions, you don't have this part, you just have this part, and we're saying y of s is now something times u of s. Well, that something has to be your transfer function. Right? It's the output divided by the input. That's the definition of g. So, that was, so this is what we're, what we're looking at here, then, is that we could find uh, kind of the big result here is that then we can say that g of s transfer function is a c s i minus a inverse b plus d. You know, a lot of times we don't have a d, but this then is your transfer function. And so again, you have to have zero initial conditions, it's unique, right? So if you're looking at this in terms of and it's a bunch of matrices, right? You're going to do that. Yes. I look for the definition. Unless I'm missing something that looks like a linear combination of the S's, which is linear, but transfer functions are not always linear. Ah, 
So S is just, S is the complex number for the link to a class of transforms, right? <coughs> Uh, you go back to kind of just thinking of this whole thing with uh, you know how do you do this is this is this is your Laplace transform definition. Uh, if you look at the complex plane, you have a complex number s, it's some like sigma plus j omega. This is like the real part of s, which would be some sigma and sigma, and then the imaginary part of s, which would be just your uh, J omega here, your omega. So you have a, a, the complex, the um, axis, and then the real axis by imagining the real. If you do any complex number like 2 plus J, I'm using J for the imaginary, the square root of the negative point. So, kind of complex numbers is a nice way to represent signals. So, we took the time domain. And we go to the frequency domain by using all class transforms. And it's all built upon complex numbers and understanding Euler's equation and all these you know, representing, you know, you're basically saying any any signal can be represented. It's kind of like going back to 40 transforms. You're looking at any signal represented by can be represented now that's imaginary and complex part. Right? I'm looking at that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like we're looking at a signal and you say, well, it has a magnitude and a phase, or it has a real and imaginary part. You're always looking like two things. That's kind of based upon this whole theory behind Laplace transforms, which then lets you look at signals in the frequency domain. You keep track of, you know, what's the frequency of the signal? What's the magnitude of the signal? Or what's the real and imaginary part of the signal? So that's kind of the background. So that's the S variable that's kind of carried through. This is Laplace transform stuff here. So this is all Laplace transform, and transfer function is in Laplace transform notation because it's a Laplace transform of your impulse response, which is a time domain function. Going back to this, you put delta T in the impulse, and you get G to T coming out the impulse response. Yeah. So it's a really beautiful theory. It's all kind of, you know, you see it all, you can use time domain frequency domain to go through. But if you, um, you can look up some Laplace, I think we can post the, maybe saying we can post, I think we have, actually, I think it's under an extra review. It might be Laplace transform pairs of properties. You see that just based on the definition, like the derivative goes to this and the you know, signals go to there. Um, anyways, uh, is that clear? Okay, so here you have this, uh, the G of S, uh, which is our transfer function. Started with state space, so we see, okay, given state space, we now see that's the transfer function, right? So in MATLAB, it's going to be very easy to, uh, to actually do that. We actually see that later. Um, but it's really under, if you understand that, the class transforms will see immediately how you can actually redirect that. And if you look at doing uh, this SI minus A inverse, uh, we'll do that. We'll kind, of, we'll, we'll kind of use MATLAB, but if you look at kind of just, I, it's just like an example to say, well, what is this SI minus A inverse? If I give you some simple A, you know, some of this you can, you can do by hand, but a lot of it, if it's any bigger, it's really hard to do. Right? And then if I want to, how do, how do you compute this SI minus A inverse? You know, so here it just says 2 by 2, by n is 2, so the x state and only two states, so we have x dot is ax, we'll just lose your A matrix. And other things. But just to part, you know, if you want to find this SI, you got to find the transfer function, maybe, maybe you also are given C, you have to be given C, B, and D also, but just the complex part is, or the hard part is doing this inverse of this matrix, right? So to do that. Because the other part, C is a matrix, B is a matrix, D is a matrix, you just want to put your right? But to do this, if you remember, this is going to be the, uh, if we do this, you have to do the, um, uh, you, have to, you actually have to write, if, like, if we write this out, like, you know, A, 1, 1, B, 1, 2, B, 2, 1, B. Two, two, kind of the elements that way, and then I write what is what would this be? So here you would actually have to be uh, 
Um, so here we have to do the, you actually have to take the, um, let's write it out. So we have to, we actually have this S like this, right? Here's your S times I, and then you'll be subtracting the A. I'll do that a little later, right? So this is what you have here. I minus A input, right? So here's your S I minus A, right? So it's kind of really, and then, so what it, in this case, what does this end up being? This ends up being S, your S minus zero, and then your minus one, 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 minus one, and then you have um, S plus two, right? So you end up with a matrix like this. A lot of this is like it's going to go whoosh and map out. You're not going to even see this, but you have to. You know, this is like the beauty of a home that you know, they're only doing two by two. Right? Uh, so here we have to take the inverse of a two by two, right? So there are formulas like if you have this, uh, you know, how do you take the inverse of, of the matrix here? Right? So you have to do one over the. Um, we probably don't really need that thing up there. So it's one over the determinant, right? The determinant, and then you have to multiply by the adjoint. And so this is two by two. So one of the determinant, right? So you actually have to find, like here, if I wanted to take y and minus y again. So if I wanted to find a inverse, for example, this is, if we let that be a, um, it's going to be the determinant is the, you take the, multiply this minus the crossing, multiply this thing minus that way. So it was a, one minus a, two, two minus a, one, two, eight, two, one. So that's the determinant. And then you have to multiply by the adjoint. So the matrix, you flip the diagonals, right? So this becomes A, two, two, A, two, and then you change the sign of the other one. Uh, a, a, sorry, a, one, two, one, two, eight. So it's, I mean, you go back and look kind of, this is a linear algebra. One of the determinant and the adjoint. So the same thing you have to do here. You want to do the determinant and the adjoint is kind of the same. That two by two method. Or you can use full format out there. So what you end up with, since I'm a problem to the whole thing but you end up with this uh, function. That, so the, deter the determinant, would, in this case, is you have s times s plus two, two and then you're subtracting that. So you get this s squared plus two s plus one times the matrix of other things to get s plus two s and then minus one to one, right? So it's the determinant times the adjoint. And then you kind of put it together where you see, well, we're gonna get a whole bunch of things if you get this s plus two over that s plus two s plus one. You get one over that s squared plus two s plus one. You get minus one over that s squared plus two s plus one. And you get s over that. S squared plus two S plus one. So that's just this SI minus A. And then you'd have to multiply by that C and the D and the D to get the But if you look at this, so in terms of this, this is just SI minus A, right? So you have this matrix of, of polynomials in here, right? So this is kind of what's behind that. If you look at, uh, and we don't have to do this one. I mean, you can do it. I mean, even two by two is kind of complicated. Um, so that's how you would find the transfer function from the state space. And these transfer functions, so if you look at it like in terms of this example, you know, we have here, you can, there are term, uh, characteristics of transfer functions being, so in this case, they're rational functions, right? So you can say that they're uh, proper rational or um, strictly proper. So if you look at the, uh, so now if you just look at the trans transfer function, um, we'll call it G of S. Uh, it's the numerator of S over some denominator of S. Okay? And it's going to be some kind of polynomial of S. Uh, you can just call it like N of S over D of S. So these are polynomials in S that complex number, like what we have here. So you see a polynomial over a polynomial, right? So you have S plus this polynomial in S. We could have called it something else, but that's just what it is, right? So in terms of algebra, right? So the numerator and denominator are these polynomials over polynomials. They have degrees, like in this example, 
And this is not the transfer function, but just, you know, for example, if this were the transfer function, we have degree one on top and degree two on the bottom, which is the power of the S term. Right? So you had, like, for example, we can look at, uh, I could just write for, you know, for example, um, you have like S plus two over S plus two S plus four. So the degree of the numerator here is one, the degree of the denominator is two, right? You can have, you know, it depends on the system, right? So this is this thing that all this comes from the state space, right? Depends on your system. I mean, it's just like very easy. So what you can say then in terms of you can say that uh, it's uh, proper rational proper rational transfer function if you have the degree of n of s uh, is less than equal to the degree of d of s. Uh, and you can say strictly proper strictly proper if it's less than time equal to. So equal to would be like, so if I had S squared plus something on top and on the bottom, right? That means proper rational. Uh, I mean, strictly, strictly proper. And then a proper rational is if you have this, or, or strictly proper is if it's always one higher, at least one higher on the bottom. So there's not, these are just more like definitions for the transfer function. So that would be the transfer function. The denominator of the transfer function is also called a characteristic polynomial. And this will be like later we'll see that the roots of the characteristic polynomial are very important in systems, right? And that's how we get the roots of roots of this become your right? either you can think about in um, in the frequency you're doing talking about poles and zeros in your transfer function, or we can think about like values, which we'll be using. To looking at that. Um, so here we have, in this case, you would think about this. So that's going from, so this is going from the, uh, maybe I'll just try to do the If we have state space going to the transfer function, we have to do this type of math, or you have to use the function in that lab. Okay. So this is what's kind of We have that equation C S I minus A B, uh, C, C S I minus A inverse from B plus D, right? So that's kind of the formula for the transfer. So you have states. So if we want to go the other way, so what if you're given, what if you want to, uh, so maybe you're given, uh, given the transfer function, say a lot of times you see the transfer function can be written in terms of, here I'm going to write a theta 1, s to the n minus 1, uh, theta, um, n, and then this is s to the n plus alpha. So these are like powers of the going down to the zero power um, at the end. And you see, in this case, I'm writing in terms of the uh, Proper rational meaning the denominator is at least one more than the numerator power. If not, you can do long distance. So if we want to, you want to find the state space. Uh, uh, representation. So how to do this? Well, there, you know, in math lab, it's going to be a command, right? But we don't know to do that, but. In terms of doing it here, we can actually, there's some known forms. You can actually read off the coefficients and put them into your A, B, C, D matrices. And we'll see later why uh, some of this is what we'll call it. This is like canonical forms, which mean they're kind of standard forms that you can go this way. It's easier to find now. Just use MATLAB before MATLAB. You have to go through and do a lot more stuff. But if we look at this first one, it's called controllable. I'll just do one of them. Canonical form, or sometimes you speak called CCM. And there's one called observable canonical form, which is really just kind of the transfer. Uh, this will be related later when we start talking about a system property called controllability. But this is one way you can actually do that. So here we can put the uh, 
but the A matrix would be something like this to have a zero, to have a one, and then these ones are like coming off diagonally. And you put your um, coefficients here. Maybe I should write, let me write another term here. So this is s to the n plus alpha 1 s to the n minus 1. Maybe something like that. So it goes from alpha 1 and alpha 2 is on s to the minus 2. So you can kind of bookkeep all of your uh, this in here. This is actually over here. And then all of these are 0 and all these are 0. And then your c is going to be uh, the a to n. Minus one, one, and then your B is going to be zero, zero, and one. So there's another another version you can do is called a verbal canonical form, which is really transposing this type of stuff. And sometimes you'll see the coefficients written on you know, over here, which is okay. It's just a matter of how you label your states. So this then, x dot equal a x plus b u, and y c x in this case, like d, d is zero. Um, given the transfer function, you can write state space just by bookkeeping those coefficients that are on the polynomials of s. It's really cool to go back and forth. If you're given a state space, you can you compute all those matrices to find the transfer function. If you're given the transfer function, you can do some kind of bookkeeping on this. So and yeah, and then later in Mount Lab we'll see that it'll be it'll be a lot easier. Uh, okay. Any questions so far on what we're doing here? So one more thing we wanna talk about before we uh, is this concept of a equivalent. Oh wait, question, yeah. So, when we go into the space state, when we're looking at x dot of t, um, that's we're just that x dot of t come is coming out of uh, g of t. No, yeah. So, so this so I'm writing in this case. I was just writing the uh, matrices, right? So, so here I'll just continue writing. So from here, when then you have I have x dot of t not a x of t. Plus b, not u of t, and then y of t, x of t, plus, well, in this case, d is zero. So I get d is zero. So this then would be your state space. So I went transfer function given to state space. That's all I really was showing on that. So the other way we had, we were given state space, right? So well, if we're given given state space, we can find the transfer function. Given the transfer function, we can find state space. Oh, we're just going back. So I thought we were going yeah. from time. Um, was the time variant to st space space state? State space. Yeah. And it's a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to say that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, if we, so in this case, it's no transfer function is always frequency joint, right? So because we took time domain, differential equations, maybe is one way, take a Laplace transform of differential equations, and you have your Laplace transform, and you find the input or output over the input of those two, and that's the thing. So, so if you have a... You know, it's usually, in, you know, for our system, it's all so if you have a time domain function, then you put that into either you do a transfer function, put that into into transfer function state, and then you go into space state, and then you can go back and forth. So in terms of the oh oh I see so you, so you're talking about yeah so one way you could do it I think I can take it so you're saying what if you're given uh, g of t for example. Right. And that's our impulse response. So that's your impulse response, right? So what can we do if we give that? So here, you know, how to get this? I put an impulse into my system times time doing method. And I say, what's the output if I put an impulse in? This is it. I define it to be GT. 
So I put an impulse in, I get, oh, you get something, and okay, call that function should be okay. Right? So that's one way. So then you would take the Laplace transform of this G of T, right, it's that formula, and that would be your two pass. So this is your transfer function of the system. So in this case, you know, G of S is Y of S uh, divided by U of S, right? Or you can say Y of S is G of S times U of S, right? And the impulse response, you know, Y T is the convolution of G with any input, right? So now, now if you're given this, well, then I can find G of S, then if G of S looks like this, is proper rational or strictly proper, then I can kind of bookkeep all those coefficients on my polynomials of S like this to give me state. Can you go directly from a time into a uh, state space, or do you have to do the oh, transform first? Yeah, so we first. did that last week. So another, so this is one method. So the other way, what did we, what did we do? We have, so given, say you're given a differential equation, it could be higher order, whatever, maybe like fourth order or something. You know, um, maybe it's a mass spring damper, or a rotational transition system, or circuit, right? Or it could be a couple of cascading systems, like couple circuits, maybe very, you know, maybe fourth order, you have some, you know, some couple different, uh, in this case, uh, you know, variables, uh, like functions of time and second derivatives or something like third derivative or something like that. So if you're given a differential equation, right, so then we, we were able to, uh, if, you, if you picked uh, the states, right, say x, x, and t, in this case you have four, in this case you have four of them, right, if you wanted to maybe, maybe some kind of integrator like system with the mass spring damper, remember it was like position velocity acceleration, you know, keep having integrated system like that. And then, then you could write this state, state six, then you write this dot of t, which would be this whole you know, x one of t, x two of t, whatever, uh, x three, x four, I'm just kind of reading it last time, and then it's this whole a matrix, right, a matrix times that your um, uh, x1, x4, right, plus whatever b is here, and then whatever, it's the whole state space, but you break it up into, from a differential equation, so one way, differential equation, you can directly pick states, if it's, if you can figure it out, like if it's like integrators, like what we did last week, and then you can write state space, or you can say differential equation, there's another way where you can put the differential equation directly into Laplace to give you the, um, you know, this is kind of not, not, you can just transfer. Another way you can take Laplace transforms of your differential equation, a whole differential equation, and that'll give you the transfer function, right? Because G of S would be Y of S uh, over U of S. Because you would have input outputs defined in the differential equation. So there's a lot of ways to kind of connect to them. And this only works with linear systems? Uh, so yeah, this is linear. No, yeah, so only linear. LTI systems this works well, for? Well, so we're talking about also space-based can be linear time varying systems, right? So you can have that. Uh, the transfer function method we're talking about is linear time variant. Okay. Yeah, and systems are, in this case, we're talking about positive systems, so that makes Zero initial conditions. So all this is related. Right? You can kind of find different ways you can solve for the output. Given the input, you want to solve for the output. We had talked about time domain, frequency domain, and state space. And now we're talking about how to go between you have this transfer function, how to go and you know state space to transfer function is kind of, it's used a lot in, in terms of um, linear system theory, going between you know, if you a lot of times you're given like I said, you're either given the transfer function uh, or a bunch of transfer functions with multiple input, multiple output, or maybe you're given the impulse response, and then you have to figure out, well, let's put it in, I'll, I'll put all that stuff in the state space, right? So it's kind of neat, so it, it all, uh, all these methods kind of relate to each other, so it's not like you're, you're talking about the same system, that's what I'm saying. But that's kind of makes sense too. In 
next week, I'm probably going to go pretty much into the, the next part because we're going to want to spend some more time on the lab. But. So, with all these different ways to you know, model the system, right? So, one, one of the methods of using, um, using state space, right, you can figure out, uh, or, or transfer functions, either way, you can determine if two systems are equivalent. Or if two, you're really saying are two models equivalent, right? So there's different ways to model a system, right? So if you think about it, and I'm sure we'll have time to go through an example, but you have a circuit, and you can do the mesh method, right? To come up with equations, you can do the normal method, come up with another set of equations. And that circuit's still the same thing, right? It's not like you change your circuit. When you come up, you're going to come up with two different sets of differential equations. And when, when you're writing, well, you're writing different things. You're writing maybe the voltage here, the voltage there, but it's still the same circuit. So the concept of equivalent systems um, is kind of important. There are two, really two ways. And we'll go through this more also in the uh, so, how do you determine if two systems are, are equivalent or not? Uh, so, here there's one is called a zero state. So that, so, here when I say zero state, I mean zero initial condition, like the initial condition is zero. So, then you're usually thinking transfer functions, right? So, uh, this is not the same. Uh, if, uh, the, say, um, so here we want to say, first we want to say like two systems are called uh, zero state equivalent if uh, they have the same, uh, same transfer function. So you'll have two systems maybe from different methods like the mash or something like, and you find the transfer function using those states that you type. And then you say, well, this transfer function is they're the same thing, exactly the same polynomial or polynomial. And you can say zero state equivalent systems. The other one is algebraically equivalent. Equivalent. So this is if you can find some algebraic relationship between the two systems. When I talk about a system of state space, we have like a set of states here, and then a set of states. Pick a different set of states. And you write out your equation for state space. And you're kind of looking at that. So in this case, you would have maybe you have two systems like um, uh, x dot here, ax and then you have y. So say this is system one, and then you have like a system two. I'll call it x bar here. Only for bars, okay. And then my bar equals c bar, x bar plus c bar, c bar. So say I have two different state spaces. Uh, you can see the same circuit, but you will write two different state spaces for the same circuit, just by picking different states. Right? It depends on what you're doing. So it's algebraically equivalent. So these two, you would say algebraically equivalent. Uh, if um, there exists uh, a non singular matrix, uh, we'll call it P. So, non singular means you can take the inverse, you can use the inverse of this thing, uh, such that uh, in this case you can relate the two all, such already here. So, then you can have like x bar is Px. Uh, a bar is P, A, P inverse, and then B bar is P, D, C bar is C, P inverse, and D bar equals D. So these two different ways of saying equivalence, right? So it's kind of easy. You have, say you have these two systems, right? Two different ways. You put two different states, really, that's what you're doing. It. Same circuit, same you know example, same robot, whatever. And you say, well, the zero state equivalent, you just find the transfer function, right? C, SI minus A inverse B plus D here. 
and then the same thing here, we're using these ABCs, right? And if you get the same transfer function, your zero state equivalent. Algebraically equivalent is if you can put this right, this key is here, like one set of states is related to the other set of states from this linear operation. Like maybe your x1 here is x1 plus x2 of these states, you know what I mean? And maybe your x2 over here is the same as x3 over here. You just kind of relabel it, you can even do that. So do you have the same pop? What's that? Do you have the same pop in the other two all? Uh, so in this case, you would have, uh, well, no, because your output could be, like, this output is cx plus du, this one is c bar x bar plus d bar u bar, and the c bar and d bar, you know, are related to the other, it's like you have two, two descriptions, maybe, maybe I'll, and so, so the outputs are different, yeah, you can see that, in terms of doing that, but in, just kind of see how, how you would, how you would do this. I'm sorry, maybe I'll have, I think we just do a simple, simple example, if you have something, uh, like your input maybe to a circuit, some voltage, maybe I won't do the, this is all going to be very kind of simple, but you can kind of look at the description here. So this is just one farad, one ohm, one henry, and Let's see, so you're gonna say what you're you can pick you can pick how how would you actually in this case you would actually want to do you know input to output. I can pick a different output also for the system. So we can actually write equations of state space for the circuit two different ways, right? So one way would be you know nodal, I looked at the nodal method. So nodal method, um, so state variables I'll pick. I'll let x1 be the uh, inductor uh, current, right? And maybe x2 is going to be the capacitor voltage. So it's really about picking the state. So here I'm going to have to do it differently. So x1 would be inductor current. So this is my x1, right? And the next two is the capacitor's voltage, so plus minus x2. Right, so I can kind of do a nodal method on that one. And the other the other method would be to say mesh method. So here I would pick the states. Right? So this will be our x1 bar. It's going to be the loop uh, current on um, the left hand side. And x2 bar is the same loop current on the right hand side. If you remember doing these equations, if you guys have done these before, they're kind of fun. You this so then this would be this would be your x1 bar, this would be x2 bar. And we can do them the same way. Right? So it's the same circuit, but I take different states. So if you go through this example, uh, you can write the nodal method using these x1, x2, write the mesh method, come up with equations, right? And then you gotta put it into, you're, you're basically putting, just writing this into, into state space, right? And you have things like I is CDBDT, L is IDT, all the C, R, L, the RLC is all one, so maybe I just see it. So the nodal, you go, you're gonna look at the KCL, like at this top node here, right? You can look at coming up with the equations. So you get two equations. The two equations are going to be uh, KCL at you know, that node A, if I call that A or something, I call it A. And then you, you have KVL uh, at the left hand side. So I can do K, the voltage around the left hand side, I can do all the currents going into the node. You come up with equations. The mesh method, you do, you end up doing the, the two mesh equations of the same thing, right? That one I go, I'm not gonna go through, so this would take, this would actually take a long time to do it. I can just kind of show you, if you do this with these states, what happens is you end up getting x1 dot, x2 dot, uh, something. I mean, it ends up looking different. Uh, so here you have x1, x2 plus, and it depends.
pen and what I, I picked my output here and be just a second. The second state here. And over here, I end up getting next one bar dot. Oh, this state, so the ABC here would be minus one, uh, minus one, one minus one zero. I just wrote X bar for no notation. So this would be kind of an exercise. If you have more time, we're going to go through. But when, this is kind of like, you know, Dot dot dot. I picked. You can if you want to look at those. I I picked those different states. You can see the different methods. The same circuit. I came up with two different state spaces because I picked the different states. I'm keeping track of these two states. Maybe the sensors, and I'm keeping track of these two states. Right? But you're keeping track of these two. Then the question is, okay, are they equivalent? Well, in what sense? Are these zero state equivalent? Are they algebraically equivalent? So you have to go through, okay, we gotta find the transfer function. For the first one, the test would be here's my A, B, C, D, X, C, S, I want to say inverse P. Let's see, there's no D, so we're lucky, right? So you end up finding the transfer function here and here, and you see what they look like. And I think in this case, they, I have the example done, I'm pretty sure they, yeah, they come out to be the same. The transfer function is like 1 over s squared plus s plus 1. Right? It's the RLC circuit, so you're going to need a second order characteristic polynomial happening. And then you say, well, are they algebraically equivalent? And to do that one, you have to find a P matrix. Um, so that's kind of a little, but it's a little harder to do the algebraically equivalent. You actually have to find this on singular P. And by this is kind of trial and error, because you're kind of saying, well, how does the, the main thing here was. You know, gotta you gotta find this relationship, right? How does x bar relate to x's? Here's two by two. So you can well, I cannot look and see. Well, are they related somehow physically up here? Or how 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 does the loop kind of relate to this? It's like I think one is like x one minus x two or something. You know, you have to you, you look at it, right? So you can see that they they will in this case this example is not we want to go to. Um, You'll see they're both algebraically um, But so these type of methods exist. That's basically, I don't want to go into the weeds of the line. I spend an hour reading the equation. But, um, you can then look at, you can come up with different models, right? Depends on the states, which we see here, and the state for equivalent. Any questions on this? Yeah? Naive question, but in the diagram, what's the y? Ah, so in this case, I, I find the y, right? So uh, you can see, well, I wrote it out for you here, right? So in this case, my output, I chose my output here, which then dictated my c. But I said my output was just x2. Sure, but I chose that, yeah. So then, so this is actually my output is right here. That's for this system. Right, so this should have been bar over here, right? Why, why? I guess the reason I'm asking is because of the previous question where and I think it's hard to, hard to imagine how the two models would, how the U and the Y would be different in the two models, but they would still be able to be equivalent. Ah, yeah, so that, so, it's like magic, too. these <laughs> together. So, so in this case, my output, I chose the, out, the output here, I said the output is the uh, voltage across the, the capacitor here. Uh, and then over here, the output in this case was, uh, in this case, I had to do the, uh, it ended up being, sure. in this case, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. You have to look at the, it's the, it's actually then, in this case, it's what it's the voltage across the, uh, uh, you know, so the difference between the loop currents is the going, what's going down the, the the current going down the middle. Yeah, so this, I mean, there's a lot more behind this than too much time. There's a lot of algebra to do the algebraic method. But then you have to, you have to find P, make sure it's on the same. And then you can check that you can go between the A to C's, A bar, B bar, C bar, by P. Yeah, 
So this is probably the, getting more into the linear algebra part of linear system theory, but you see this. You see this. Uh, a lot of times it, it's, it's probably easier to find this because we'll see in that one we can just do. I think we can probably stop if we want to start to do the allow part. Any other questions? Or we can, we can ask me questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions first, and then we'll come up and ask me more questions. The note, I have a lot more of my notes, and the books have more examples. The notes I choose have a lot of detail too, but this is kind of I'm showing you kind of the the tools we can use. Okay, so we'll take, we can take a break. Things gonna set up. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because you're not looking at both so The zeros don't know zeros just so when you're looking at it, you can see the city. We're looking at it at the vertical position and where you want to stay, right? And you're going to get a lot of zero because it's not all so the same way it's doing this, but it's not like this. So it's a linear position. It's a zero. 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 It should be a function of the angle as well. It is, until you linearize it and you approximate it down. So, at equilibrium, it's not a problem. 
So if you just because it's error, linearized, you have a functional yeah. Yeah. Now if you add yeah. error states in there, because then you don't have to find the plus and minus right. yeah. on each of it, then you can start to see, and that's what the plots are for. You can actually see where it goes back and forth. Okay. Uh, errors and errors, and then it comes on the so today, <laughs> what we are going to do is we will represent our system in a state space representation. And then from there, we will use the state function of the given system. So we are going to use the state space representation of the given system. And also, we go back to the state space representation of the system from the given system. So that's what we will do for today. The subset of the that we will do is we will actually implement a system in a simulator mode and then check the output when we change the input. If you remember what we did last week, we actually used a function called initial step for uh, inputs to find the output for the given input, right? But today we will do the exactly the same simulation, but using simulator. Okay. That's the two things that we will do today. So in the demo problem, a system is given in a state space representation. So here this matrix is A and this is B. And here we have C in identity matrix. And what is D? Yeah, zero. zero matrix. Okay. So we have four matrices to represent a system. Okay. So the first part of the whole problem is we make a space space representation of the given system. So in the method lab, always we start from clearing the workspace. And then we define four matrices as given here. A, B, C, D. So when you write down or when you declare an identity matrix, you can actually write all the elements of an identity matrix. But if the identity matrix has a very large size, then you can use function called I. So in this I, so means identity. And then if you have those zero, so your matrix has all zero elements, then you can use function called zeros. So this will give you exactly the same output as you write here. And if you have a matrix whose elements are all ones, then you can use function called ones. Then you will get the matrix without typing in all the elements. So now we did part A. So let's do the part B. So part B says convert the state space representation to a transfer function. So for this topic, we will use function called SS to here. SS stands for state space, 2 is 2, and then uh, here is transfer function. So as it name has state space to transfer function. So let's check that part. So first, I will declare those four matrices. Then I uh, will find out the transfer function. Okay. And this function returns two values, basically two arrays. One is called num, and the other is called length. Uh, this is for numerator of the transfer function. The second return value is the denominator of the transfer function. So once I 
execute this function, then I will have two arrays that is just shown here. So if you see this one, for denominator, it is 1, 3, 0. What it means? It means the coefficient of the denominator from highest order to the lowest order. So if we have three elements, what is the order of the denominator? Okay. Second order denominator. So the coefficient of the second order term in the denominator is 1. The first order is 3, and then the, the constant is 0. So basically, s squared plus 3. And then we have numerator who has uh, two rows. It means there are two possible transfer functions available for a given system. Does it make sense? So you may have multiple transfer functions for the state space to be the as we did in the class. So we have two sets of numerators, which corresponds to two sets of transfer functions. Uh, so far, so good. Okay. So we found the transfer function in part B. So in part C, now what we want is, if we are having transfer function, then can we go back to state space representation? That's what we did during the class, right? So for this step, we use function called tf to ss. Yeah. So its naming is very intuitive, right? transfer function to a space-based representation. So then can you tell me what will be the input argument for this function? What should we provide to this function to get the uh, space-based representation? Exactly. So when we type a transfer function in MATLAB, we should provide numerator transfer function and denominator of transfer function, the way it accepts is exactly the same as what we return from SS to TF. So we give numerator, denominator in this order, then it will provide state space representation of the system. So in order to distinguish ABCD that we actually type in a previous week, I made it double A, double B, double C, double D. Okay. So if everything is correct, then double A, double B, double C, double D has to be the same as A, B, C, D. Do you agree? No? Why? I mean, if we have a state space representation, we should have the same A, B, C, D. Uh, I think you guys already know the answer because of the comments I made. Right now. <laughs> but let's check. <coughs> let's run this guy. Then let us compare these two and these two, these two, and these two. So double A is not equal to A, right? Also, B is not the same as double B, and C is not the same as double C. Okay, the reason is once we have a state space representation of a system, we can get out one transfer function, a unique transfer function, I would say. But for a unique transfer function, there are multiple ways to represent the system in state space. Does it make sense? <coughs> Does it make sense? So if we have a different set of ABCDs, <coughs> but they might have, or they could have the same transfer function. Right? So let's do that here. 
So now I use, it is not part of the demo problem, but now I convert this state-space representations of double A, B, C, D to a transfer function using a function called SSPTF, as we did before. Then, numerator reform, denominator reform, has to be identical <coughs> to what we found in the previous step. For this step, they have to be identical, right? Because they are representing the same system. So transfer function has to be the same. So if I find this one, then now you compare these two, and you will see that the transfer functions are identical from ABCD and double ABCD. Uh, so far, so good? So if you were to take the eigenvalues of A and double A, they be the same. The same should be, yes. Because it is meaning the same system. Uh, any questions up to this point? And this is the one part that we try new in this lab. So now we will find the response when the input is a step. But rather than using the function step as we did last week, we will make a single link model for given system. So for that, you will need these blocks from the single uh, file, that you will connect those two those blocks to find the output, and then see the output and plot the output in the vector net. So what I do is, I make this file, uh, let me So this is a flop. flop. So it is uh, clocking the system or timing the system. So in the left line, you can find it as a like, time equals an array for the simulation. That's what we did uh, last week. But in a simulation, they provide a flop for the time. So you use this one. And this block is called two of the states. As it maintains any values that say in this block is exported to the workspace of the network. So workspace is here. This is called workspace as it maintains. So any variables that you want to see in the map you can send it to block called two of the space and it will be saved here. So I save the simulation time in the worker space in order to plot the response of the system versus time. Does it make sense? So that's why I make uh, this uh, time variable to be exported to the worker space. So you can actually drag or select the step block from the library here. And this is the transfer function block. And here, actually, you can define the transfer function of the given system. So the same notation. This is the numerator coefficient. So if you go back to the numerator that we found, one of the transfer function was 0, 0, 1. So I put the 1. And the coefficient for the denominator was 1, 3, 0 in our array. So I put the 1, 3, 0 there. And the rest of it, I use default values. So actually, you need to change only those two. Um, uh, 
as it results in it uses one. But if I want to write the essence here, then I have to write one zero zero. Does that make sense? <coughs> and since we have two transfer functions from the given system, I may use exactly the same graph, but I change the transfer function here to be one zero at the numerator function. So if you let's see. Here, if we see the numerator, one row was 0, 0, 001, that was corresponding to the first block of transfer function. And the second row was 0, 1, 0. So that is the right block of the similar number. That's how I set the numerators to the transfer function. Uh, does it set up? Yes, that's right. You mean x1 and x2. So when it's u over or y1 over u and then it's y2 over u. Yes. You Yes. So since we have from this representation, we need two transfer functions. So up to this point, is it all clear? Okay. And rather than running right now, the part E and F are asking us to find the response of the system and the input inside and the response of the system when the input is ramp. Okay. And if you see this model, what you only to, what you need to change is the input <coughs> because we are considering basically the same system, which means the same transfer function. So that is the benefit of using similar link over MATLAB coding. So if you want to consider many different type of inputs or some any arbitrary inputs, if you use this method, once you fix the transfer function in the other settings, then all you need to change is the input. That is the benefit of doing this similar. Yes, that's right. So if I just want to make another system, then I can select them and copy and paste it. Much, much simpler. Right? And then in order to plot in the MATLAB, I expose all the variables for the output and the inputs to the workspace in the MATLAB. Just to go from <coughs> If you are more familiar with Simulink, you can actually plot here directly using the monitor tool. Uh, that's what we will do like later in the workshop. Uh, slightly, I will introduce it today, but for this purpose, let us use workspace and plot functions in uh, the Sounds okay? So, uh, Step input, ramp input is okay, but for sinusoid inputs, there is some more things you need to set up. In this question, we are saying the input is a sine wave where the uh, angular velocity omega is 100. It is unit of radian per second, where the offset is 1. So, I set amplitude of one and bias, which means adding some values or shifting up by one. <coughs> and then I set the frequency of the sinusoidal to be 100 radian per second. So up to this point, it makes sense. And since there is no initial phase, I put the zero radius. But this part is important. So as a default, when you just uh, put out this block, it is zero as a default. But the 
uh, you have to choose the same time for this one because MATLAB is basically all the computers are discrete time system. So you need to define what will be the sample time for this one. If you don't use specific sample time and just use a default of zero, then you will see the aliasing effect on the plot, which is not uh, perfectly correct. Does it make sense? Uh, it will run uh, correctly in the simulated model, so the output will be okay. But if you want to plot the input, which is the sinusoidal, without correct sampling rate, it will see the idea, which is not good. So that's why I sample the time as 0.01 second. Does it make sense? So with this simulation model, what I will do is, I will use a function called sim. It is a simulating the simulator model. So inside the input argument for this function is name of the SNS file. So I call it that underscore demo. So I put that file name. And it will simulate the simulator model that I just made and then expose all the values to the workspace. Uh, so you're saying the same like, final actors yes. over so the right? Yes. So kind of like a right? Yes, this happening. Yes. So the scene will uh, run or execute this app, yes, that is fine. So now uh, we will generate the yes. I just wanted to confirm this part's only if you are putting out all the graphs to um, MATLAB, not using simulate, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So now I uh, will plot the uh, figures from that. Uh, any questions? Okay. And here, figures for the uh, set response and the web response is okay. But the key thing is this one, sinus of the one. So, Actually, we don't know what will be the simulation time because we just call, we use the block called time or clock, right? We don't know what will be the, the time range for this one. So I take out the time vector or time array from the simulation and then I will make another time array for plotting the sinusoidal input. Does it make sense? Because the reason is, in the simulating model, I don't know what will be the size of output and input, because I didn't define the clock, clock right? We don't know. But in order, but if I make a specific sampling rate in the sinus of the input, I'm pretty sure that the length of this one will not be the same as the clock. Because clock is just running, and then I make a specific sampling time. So there is no guarantee that the length of this one will be the same as the length of the clock. Does it make sense? So what I do is, I take the initial value and the final value of the time, which is time of 1 and time of n. Okay. And then I will make an equally spaced array using function called line space. So it means I use the time beginning and time n, and I will equally space that uh, values and make it one array. That's what line space does. So then, this time size, time sign, will be the same length of the input sign or input signal of the sign. Okay. Uh, 
uh, any questions up to this point? Okay. So then I am ready to run the simulink model. So I run this model. Then we will have all the required variables in the workspace and using those values I plotted three outputs for the three respective inputs. So the first one corresponds to part D where the input is a step. So this blue one is step function which is the input and then we have two outputs y1 and y2 that are represented by this red and yellow color. And for next one, we have a sinusoidal input with a frequency of 100 radian per second. And we have those two outputs. And also for the lamp input, we can have those outputs from this system. <coughs> So, any questions up to this point? So, do you see the difference between using the functions in, in the method to find the output or the method of using the simulator? You see the difference. So, it is hard to say one is always better than the other. And if one is already better than the other, the other will be vanishes. There are very good and bad things between those two methods. So depending on your preference and depending on the application, you choose one that you do more But uh, one thing I can say is either method will be the same method. Uh, any questions up to this point? Sounds good? And let's do the interest problem. So now we consider a new system where A is given as 2 by 2 matrix here, then D, and this is the C, and now D is 2. Uh, you can say D is one by one matrix or, or, or just a scalar value. Uh, it is, uh, there is no significant difference between saying one by one matrix or a scalar value. Then, what is the size of Y here? Is it, so, what is the size of the matrix Y? One by two. Any any guesses? Two by two. Two by two. Okay. So it will never be exceeding three. So I guess one by one. Yes, it is one by one. Yes. The reason is if we right. compute the first function of this equation, y is basically three x one plus ten x two minus two u. So it will be a scalar or one by one matrix. So technically it is the same as what we did before. So I will just clear all the workspace. And then I define four matrices as given in the problem. So we just type in. So I run this code. The part B is saying that we will convert this state space representation into transfer function. So we use function SS here. So we can find the numerator and denominator of transfer function using this line. Then we will have denominator and the numerator. So we already know the y is a one by one matrix, which is a scalar. So the transfer function 
is only one. So you can see that uh, the denominator is sigma model one, and numerator is also one already, which means there is one transfer function. Which it makes sense. Let me just intuitively discuss this system. Then part C asks us make the simulation model for a given system. So for this one, I made this simulation model. So exactly the same as before, we have this plot one. And then we define the transfer function by using the coefficients of numerator and denominator. So this portion is all same, right? But we are giving different inputs like set, sinusoid, and rec as before. Uh, it is in the workspace. Yes, it is in the workspace. So you could just write anyone D or no? Uh, I think for this block, I think we should now. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it doesn't go more. Yes, it's kind of yeah. But uh, using this, uh, yeah, I think it is not uh, automatically reading the, more, mm -hmm. the space value to the one. So. Unfortunately, there is a one manual step you have to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Then we all define the system using the transfer function, and we consider three different inputs. Then we can find out the response of the system as before. Then we will see this type of uh, system. This is when the step is given, then this is the sign is given, and this is the rank is given. Uh, here, when you see it, you need to check the units, I mean the order of the axis. So when we give the sign for the we expect some signs to be read from the figure, right? But uh, here, we don't see any way. Reason is, it is 10 to the 22. It's very huge. So the amplitude of 1 is almost negligible. So when we see like, very far away from the, this graph, the sinusoid is just like a line. That's why this blue is in. And then 9 seconds later, the output of the system is expanding far away. Which is also making sense. If you see the transfer function uh, of this system, the numerator is also second one. Right? So it is not a proper rational function. And if you think the transfer function is one plus some proper rational function, right? And because of that one, the system is diverging. Does it make sense? Because it will be accumulated for a long time and it will be extended and diverging. Does it make sense? So, so all the results that we have from this simulating model is also matching with our intuitive analysis or description of the system. So that's the end of the uh, in-class problem. So is there any question for this one? Any? Sounds good? Okay. So... Yeah, you post this one. Yes. Yeah, uh, and then tonight after the class, the uh, solution for the in-class problem, I mean the code for the in-class problem, will be also uploaded. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Any questions? It's good. And we have to <coughs> compensate that.
before we actually start the lesson that uh, today after I finish this explanation, I will do the check -off. Uh When I do the check -off, uh please tell me your left group or left partner. Uh, only six groups are sending me the email. So I will check that also. So in this lab, uh, we will do two labs basically. One is the LED dimmer. So if you see the Minsec board with a small port here, there is a LED. Okay. So what we will make today is we will we will make a serial mode that we can actually dim the LED on the board by changing the potential. And potential meter is this black pill, plastic pill on the board. So if I change this potential meter, the LED is actually green. So I can show this not very good. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sure you can see this on LED. But I see in this position LED is off. And I turn it to the next, it becomes bright and brighter, and I see the blue bright in this area here. That's what we will make. And then let's do more interesting thing. The second part is reading encoders. So now you will connect this uh, level motor on the board here. And inside this level motor, there is a motor, but there is also an encoder. The encoder is uh, measuring how much the motor was rotated and sends that value to the algorithm. That's what the encoder does. And it actually counts the ticks on the motor to know or to measure how many angles so what we will do today is we will actually rotate these pins and see how this board is measuring the rotational angle. But today we are not actually measuring exact angle, but just to see the trend of increasing and decreasing. Does it make sense? Okay. So let me do a very good uh, example. So we will use the encoder example. This SRX file is containing uh, encoder block here. So in the lab manual, it says encoder.srx block. Uh, that is actually this file. So even though you cannot find that file from the list that I provided, but please use this file. It is containing that block. So what it does is we have a block for the encoder, and then this encoder block is connected to a monitor. So here we can actually uh, see how many angle was rotated in real time. So actually simulate can plot in real time. And when you want to see the values in real time from simulating, what mode should you use? Uh, I found, I received uh, a lot of questions during the office hour. How many people of you are using version 2019? Okay, almost everyone. I'm using the version 17. So uh, it has external on this head. But the, I found that external was removed in 2019. But there is uh, another tag under the hardware called tune and monitor. 
So please use tune and monitor tag instead of external. Okay. Uh, I checked it is working, so use that one. I think that was changed in 2019. Last year it was still external. It was updated. And also, there, is, there are four numbers here, 18, 19, 15, 62. Those are the pin numbers when you connect the encoders to the Arduino board. So when you use the cables, I think I can come on. Here, we use this gray cable, and this part is the uh, uh, main cable. And we have a black plug in here. And this plug in can be plugged in either this right one or the center one. Okay. Uh, on your board, can you see those two holes? One is on your left, one is on the right. Try to do the potential. Do you see that two holes? <coughs> Okay. So I'm using the middle one, and middle one is having the pin numbers for 50 and 62. Okay. So if you plug in your pin in the middle, your pin number has to be 15 and 62. If you are using the fourth that's on the left. And your pin numbers should be 18 and 19. So what I mean, what I mean by 18 and 19 and pin numbers is if you double click this model or ground, you will see that here there is a pin A and under down there is a pin B. So these two are required to measuring the clockwise count and counterclockwise count. So that's why I need the two clocks, pin A and pin B. And for that, I need to keep the two numbers in an array form. So 18 and 19 are one set, 62 and 15 are one set. So if you swap those two orders, then your increment of count will be opposite to the rotation that I use. If I use the clockwise to increase, then yours will be uh, counterclockwise to increase. Does it make sense? So now, I will use on the simulation and external mode. But whenever I start, I check in on the settings for the simulation. And then I use the fixed step size of 0.1. Uh, I think it is good to use 0.1 or 0.5 because of the sensitivity issue. Sometimes 0.01 is making a mess. So I recommend 0.1 step size. And for the hardware implementation, I definitely will use Mega 2560 and then here load and run. And I use automatically choosing combo. And it will take some time to run the simulation. And again, uh, simulating is a very, very heavy program. So it looks like it doesn't receive the command. So please wait just a couple of more sections of this rather than clicking with the time. Now it says it is building. Okay. And let's see what happens. And it takes time. So. Okay. So this message is saying some the code information, the compiling information for this block, what version I've used, <coughs> the timestamp. So up to this point, it looks like 
everything is good. And I see that the running the model and the you know, image now my book is running. And I open this Now one thing you can check is if your board is running on the external board correctly, then you will see that the TX LED, RX LED are blinking very fast, meaning that this board is transmitting some information to the MATLAB, and this board is receiving some information from the MATLAB. So it is an indicator whether your board is communicating properly with the MATLAB or simulation. So now I have this window or plugin tool that I change. You will see that the, the tip is going down and I rotate it counterwise. And if I rotate the pin counterwise, it is coming up. And I can approach the zero line, which is yellow. And if I want to go back down, then I will take this one to the um, uh, clockwise, and I see that this one. So if we are very uh, accurate to measuring the angle, then we can find some this is a counting number to find out how many uh, uh, constant or how what constant is to be applied to measure the exact. And this one is just uh, measuring the ticks. Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, does it make sense? Yes? I tried running the code and it says that I needed simulate coder and embedded coder features. I'm missing some kind of uh, features. I don't know. Uh, I guess maybe you don't have a correct compiler. To compile that model. Yeah, so I think, I think that it is for the GCC compiler. Uh, I would recommend checking whether your laptop installed GCC compiler. Okay. So, that's also a good question. So, even though you install all the packages for the IDM board, uh, sometimes you need a GCC compiler, especially for Windows users. I think I don't see any issues with uh, Mac users. So sometimes the Windows may require that she sees some higher for that moment. And if it is running on your laptop properly, it means for some reason you unintentionally install GCC compiler while you are working on a different project. Uh, any questions for this demo? Sounds good. Okay. The code for, code for LED demo and the encoder are uploaded on campus. So you can download and check and run on your uh, big set. So I think that's all for today. And then I will go around to you and check the uh, LED blinking project. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Four minutes. We've got one live stream in here. It's the only way I can learn. I don't, I don't, I don't retain information always from just reading. I go back and watch this stuff. But pick it up pretty quick. This helps with the only thing that I actually prefer at that meeting. Because I have a mind in my head. It seems that the equation from the screen to make sense of the right answer. I have no right thing wrong with It's a combination for me. I have to write, watch. Okay. Right. Every all the, the whole combination, then all three of them. The only way I can do it too. Like if I miss one step, I go off. Dance material. Well, I do when you're 40. I mean, I'm older. I was 18, 19. This is like, dude, I was in the Air Force. It's easy.
because I just have taken a bunch of them. That's probably it is, right? I know you're a guy that Thank you for your service. Absolutely. How long are you going to get in? Uh, 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 Damn, you're staying at 20. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, now with this too, because the army's 100% paying for it. Yeah, they're doing right too. Well, not the army, but the VA. No, this is, this is not even, I'm not even paying for it. Yeah, mine's not even paying Mine's both every day. For me, um, basically what they do is every year they select officers to go back to school. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Depending on where you are in there, oh, like, you know, like, mm -hmm. depending where you are.